So um, this workshop is sponsored by Ministry and Council and under the care. And um, I met Adria because she was invited to be on Wendy Cooler's um, Ministry Clearness and Support Committee. So we've been meeting by Zoom for a long time, and today I met Adri in person. <laughs> but I'd like to introduce her as a warm, caring, grounded in spirit Quaker who will bring to us today some of her wisdom that we as a meeting will benefit from. And as the morning uh, continues on, we will see how we will benefit and apply what she is going to bring to us and and take the and what's the word? Um absolutely uh, we'll bring to me yes. we'll bring to you right <laughs> so Adrian you want to introduce yourself too so yes. can I do you. that before you do that I need I to just understand time. where I can have access to my computer so should I be sitting over here so I can put this on the table Will it stretch? Will the cord stretch to the table? Yeah. Okay. You can get all kinds of plug in. There should be about Okay. Okay. Oh, you've got the. Okay. Okay. So, am, am I going to be sharing my presentation from this? For my okay, so I can just do screen share. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. See, these are the all the little technical <laughs> details. Right. So let's just see how I, sorry, I hope I don't get you this part in the Zoom and not getting <laughs> situated. Uh, this is full, but that's okay. We just don't want you to There's put another plug no, underneath the table. There's another plug underneath the table. <laughs> when Wendy uh, and I were talking this morning, and she's like, Oh, I really hope that Jim is going to be there. And I was like, Oh, <laughs> I too hope that Jim is going to be there. And I was just going to say <laughs> thank you to Jim, who offered to come early this morning to help with the tech. Mm -hmm. And if uh, he hadn't been here, we would have been having more trouble. <laughs> well, not, not that we had trouble. <laughs> yeah, we're not even going to say that we trouble. We would have had trouble. Yeah. We would have had trouble. So thank you so much for that, Jim. Um, this is oddly close to the owl. Somebody let me you know, rearrange myself. But I will say just a few words. So as Joan said, I've been serving um, on Wendy's Ministry Clearness and Support Committee. Uh, she and I um, have been fast friends and she called me out of the blue a few years ago and was like, I don't know you, but I wonder if you'd be interested in collaborating in this workshop series. And I was <laughs> like, this sounds very intriguing. Um, but I will say as much of an honor and a privilege as it's been to help Wendy because I um, feel God move in her ministry, it's been really exciting to be on her support committee and see what's happening in this meeting mm -hmm. and to feel like I have a front row seat to some real uh, life and growth and just excitement. And so I, I, you know, when the possibility came up, I was like, oh, you know, would it be helpful or would it be beneficial if I, you know, came and talked a little about spiritual gifts? Is that something that might be an area of interest? For me, the opportunity to participate with you in what the Spirit is doing in your meeting and through your meeting was um, it just felt very special and so I'm really 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 happy to be here and to meet some of the people that I've you know it's like oh this is the meeting mm -hmm. and now I'm starting to know some of the individuals and by the way I was kind of joking it feels sometimes like it feels like uh at, at least recently Sandy Spring is manufacturing friends for export because I just realized that you know um Alicia McBride, with whom I serve on the uh, ESR Board of Advisors. She's like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm missing your session. I'm like, wait a minute, you're in Sandy's Creek. Kendra was at a workshop a couple of weeks ago. I was with Will James at Sendle Hill. I was like, oh, you're in Sandy's Creek meeting? Like, where are all these Sandy's Creek meeting friends coming from? <laughs> so that has just been very, very exciting. Um, as we get started, I have my, my notes here. So I guess I should say I'm a, a member of Chatham Summit Monthly Meeting and New York Yearly Meeting. Um, a big area of concern for me in my public ministry and, and in the work that I do in my monthly meeting is 
how do we connect to the spiritual life and power that early friends experience? Because I believe it's still available for us today. And then what does that look like in the 21st century in a context that's so different in so many ways? Um, and so part of that, you know, is coming together as communities. We're not just atomized individuals, but we come together as communities. We acknowledge gifts, we discern leadings, and we come together to participate in what the spirit is doing. So that is, you know, my hope is that today we can explore what that looks like in your context. And this is a situation where kind of I'm, I've got some questions, I've got some ideas. Um, I, I can provide a structure, but the real juice has to come from you, right? Because you're experts on your community in a way that I could never be. You know, I got off the road last night. And it's like, okay, I'm going to get back on the road this afternoon. But you've lived together and loved together and taken care of each other for um, for a long time. So so that's kind of my hope for today. Um, you'll see that we're in a circle-ish, including our <laughs> Zoom folks who are definitely part of the circle as well. I guess I'll look directly at the owl. Um, so one of the areas of my professional formation that I bring into my workshop facilitation among friends is restorative practices. And so, um, you know, as many of us are familiar with or have participated in restorative circles, but I'm just going to give a couple of highlights. You know, we sit in a circle so that we can all see each other, so that we can connect to each other, so that um, we, we have that sense, even in the way that we're organized in the room, of being part of a community and responsible to each other. So this is your circle as much as it's my circle. And so if something's not working for you, let me know. Um, we will at various times be using the talking piece. I love this talking piece. Um, Kendra already knows this was one of my son's baby toys. Yeah, when he was a baby and he is eight and he is a big boy. But I love the fact that I still get to share some of that special mommy energy in my facilitation that, that his teething toy gets a, gets a second life. So this is gonna be our talking piece. When we're holding the talking piece, we have the opportunity to speak. We're not holding the talking piece, we have the opportunity to listen. Um, if we were in, um, if we were gonna spend a weekend together, we would probably spend about 45 minutes talking about what kind of expectations and commitments we would wanna make to each other in order to make sure that our time together was as fruitful and productive and safe and enjoyable as possible. But we will not be spending an entire weekend together, so we're not gonna do that. Um, I'm gonna offer a couple of things, and then if we have anything you wanna add, we can add those. And then I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself because <laughs> I've been talking a lot. Um, so the things that I, I, I think about when, when I'm facilitating in, in friends context is first I want to invite friends to speak in the language of your heart. Um, we have a huge amount of difference in experience, in perspective, in theological orientation. That is all welcome and I want to encourage you to speak in a language that's comfortable for you. I also want to encourage all of us to listen in tongues. The fact that somebody uses language that is not your language, um, I want to just invite us to be okay with that. And even though sometimes it feels like, oh, that's just not just a difference in taste, that's a real important difference. Yes, yes. And can we practice creating a space where those differences are, are welcome? Where those differences are not the focus, but are acknowledged if they need to be. Um, that can feel destabilizing. And that's part of the opportunity that we have this morning to really connect with where we really are, not to stay at a superficial level, but to say, what's your story? How have you gotten to where you are? And what does it mean to take the next step together? Um, it also feels important to just invite us all to honor each other's stories. So part of that means that the fact that somebody's sharing something here doesn't necessarily mean they would share the same story on Facebook or mm -hmm. in a different context. So when somebody <clears throat> shares a story with you, if you wanna share something out after the workshop with somebody who wasn't present, please be mindful of the, of the context that that story was shared in 
and respect the fact that you were trusted with the story. Um, and then the last one that I have is take care of yourself. So we're gonna have a break in a, at about 10.30, refuel on coffee, water, go to the bathroom, whatever you need. But if at some time that is not 10.30, you need to do any of those things or something else entirely, you should feel free to do that. And we'll be fine without you. And we'll be thrilled when you come back. Okay, I already know that one person has to leave early, which is fine. Um, and we'll be just very, very happy to have that person for as long as they're able to be with us. So before we move on to introductions, I want to ask the folks on Zoom or folks in the room if there's anything else we would want to add to that that would feel important. Mm -hmm. yes. um, so sometimes I need to stand up because of my body. I listen to my body as well as to everyone who's in the circle. So I wanted to make sure that is okay with you. If it's um, is it okay that if we move or need to stand up before ten thirty to stretch or something? Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, we all have bodies that need varying <laughs> degrees of care and, you know, are varyingly <laughs> delightful and embarrassing at, at times. Um, and thank you for sharing that. So friends might not be like, oh, what's going on over there? What's she doing? Um, and also, absolutely, please take care of yourselves. Anything else? Okay. Okay. Beautiful. <laughs> So I would invite you, because you've heard a little bit about me, um, and you, I think, all know each other, but I know very few of you. <laughs> so um, I'm going to pass the talking piece this way. I don't want to take anybody by surprise and just invite you to share your name, um, how long you've been a member or attender of this meeting, and one thing that you are bringing to this morning's conversation. You can construe that however you'd like to. Um, so again, my name is Adria. Uh, this is my first time visiting Sandy Spring meeting. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Um, and one thing that I'm bringing to this morning session is a lot of excitement and curiosity about you and where you are as a meeting around these topics. Mm -hmm. yeah, the first thing <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Deborah Vaughn. Um, I've been a part of this meeting for, I don't know, 30 some years. I don't know, somewhere. Um, what I'm bringing this morning is um, a summer of that I'm still carrying and feeling. Of just a whole lot of um, uh, stressful uh, situations and time consuming situations and um, feeling um, burdened uh, by, by a lot of it um, mm -hmm. and just working through it. So mm -hmm. that's what you got. I am in the circle, despite what Catherine says. <laughs> um, and I <laughs> no, I'm good. Listen. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm Wendy. Um, and um, I came to Sandy Spring um, with Eric Hansen, who's now my husband, um, in probably. 2012, but for Thursday night meeting. Um, and we were regular attenders at Thursday night meeting until um, until the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really our worshiping community um, for many years. Um, we got married here in 2016. Um, and um, I think we became members in 2018, maybe 2019, I don't know. Um, and, um, well, we're here. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I feel a great deal of commitment to this meeting. Um, and I know I do 
because sometimes this meeting is who I choose to have conflict with. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and um, this is where I choose to be vulnerable. Um, and this is where I choose to negotiate relationships. And I feel a great deal of gratitude about this meeting's continuing desire to have conflict, to be vulnerable, and to labor together towards the greater truth and continuing revelation. Um, we're not perfect, and I love us. And I think that that's what I'm bringing this morning. <clears throat> Um, I'm Rich Nippersage, uh married to Joan, and um, we we came to Sandy Spring in 1997, I believe, when we moved from Tacoma Park to Columbia um, for my to be closer to my job, which was in Columbia. And Joan said, oh, good, now we can worship at Sandy Spring, not at Friends Meeting or Washington. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then we became members um, very shortly after that. Um, and what I am bringing, well, and what I'm bringing today is, is for me, the uh, kind of detail-oriented uh, work that I have done mostly in finance um, has that has kind of run its course largely and the part that I am developing is the more spiritual less definable parts and so my curiosity in that area and my my willingness to learn and grow in that area is one of the reasons why I'm here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Patty Nesbitt. Um, I've been coming to this meeting probably 10, 15 years. I don't remember. Um, I've been working, running workshops in conscious of timing. So I'm going to say my curiosity and my hunger um, for more information and to be fed after putting out a lot of information. Mm -hmm. I want to be fed. I'm here for information and sharing, and I'm going to pass it so other people can do it so we can hear more. Okay. Um I do notice um, I'm Catherine Stratton Shredway and um, started coming to this meeting in 1997. And was married here to my husband, Nathan, in 1999, and became members shortly after that. And our kids have all seen them come. And then one of them has completely grown up. Um, so I bring today, um, you know, uh, overall, Oh, I think Nikki's trying to get in the side door there, maybe. Um, I bring today an overall sort of experience, excitement, enthusiasm for um, our young people, not just in this meeting, but in this country and what their um, how I'm curious how this meeting can nurture them, but also receive from them their beautiful spirit and ministry that they are exuding and living right now. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Brown. Um, I came to this meeting initially in 2001 and have been um, worshiping here since. Um, I grew up in this area um, and grew up in um, uh, a different church community, uh, worshiping with Baptists. Um, 
And um, and so I'm I, I should I should mention that I um I have a couple of children who are very important and grew up in this meeting and um, are now um, you know spread through the country and um, um, they're very much on my mind. Um, my my dad who um, is local um, and is not worshiping with friends, but um, he is very much on my mind. My my brother who is local, um, who is not worshiping with Quakers, but is following his path is very much on my mind. And so an awful lot of um, what I, um, you know, what I grow from, what I struggle from um, these days is um, being sandwiched between being a, a parent and being a child. Um, I'm Sue Scheider, and um, this is my second round of attending this meeting. I attended in the late 70s for a couple of years, and um, I resumed um, after a long absence in July. Um, and what I brought today is hopeful curiosity. I hear the theme of curiosity a lot in what people have, have shared so far. Um, but my hope is to share and connect more people in this chat. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And if we skip the round, mm -hmm. yeah. what are we doing? So, <laughs> we're, what we're doing is we're sharing your name, how long you've been a member or attender of the meeting, and what you are bringing to this morning's conversation. Oh, ready to see what's going on. Nick, you need to speak a little louder so the owl can hear you. Oh, sure. Uh, my name is Nicholas Arnold. Uh, I've been attending now for two years or something like that. Um, oh. <laughs> you can construe that however yeah. you like. No, I, I, um, I think I am most eager out of my own curiosity, so I'll follow. Hi, my name is Carol. I came here with my young two-year-old daughter in about 1992-93. Um, I left Friends Meeting of Washington. My husband got custody of that meeting. I came here, <laughs> but I was later married in this meeting. So, you know, there was a good ending to that. Um, and I was really interested in this workshop. Um, I grew up uh, always listening to call and what is your ministry in the world? And uh, my vocational decisions were tied to that. And now I find it complicated to follow that and balance my life so I can also be a fuller participant here. My call and ministry in the world takes a lot of time, including on weekends. And so I'm, I was so happy to hear that we were going to look at um, how much people listen to their call and where it takes them. Because mm -hmm. uh, I love this meeting. There's really awesome people here. And so I'm looking forward to learning more. I'm Chandra. I've been coming to this meeting since probably 93, maybe 94. I don't know when I became a member, maybe around 2000 when I started um, working with the young friends in first day school. I decided if I'm going to do that, I better be a member. <laughs> so um, I went to the spring term at Pendle Hill this year, hoping to become more connected with spirit, having felt for a while that I was disconnected from spirit. And I became interested, I heard about spiritual gifts for the first time when I was there. 
-hmm. and was curious and started learning more and went to Adria's workshop about that. And I came back to meeting again after 10 weeks away and remembered all the controversy around the budget last year and the purchase of the cottage. And I've never heard anybody talk about ministry here. I've never heard anybody talk about spiritual gifts. And I feel like there's something missing. And I don't know what to do about it. But I, I feel like it, we need to change. We need to name gifts. We need to perceive gifts. We need to engage gifts. And figure out our ministry as a meeting so that we can work on these budget issues yes. in a practical way and other issues and be more, I just feel like meeting feels flat to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm Michael DeHart. Um, I was raised by, uh, oh, I've been a member here, I think since 1984. I found myself working in a Quaker school, dating a Quaker woman, running a Quaker summer camp, and I said, <laughs> maybe I'm a Quaker. <laughs> So I applied for membership, and that's at least part of the rest of the story. Um, I'm the son of uh, an atheist, child of the Depression, was an orphan in that time, and so decided there was no God. So, uh, and a, a, a mother who um, was the daughter of what I've taken to calling educational uh, missionaries working in various Methodist colleges, helping to start two different Methodist colleges. And so that's a gap between Methodism and atheism. And so they decided we would become members of the River Road Unitarian Church, which seemed somewhere in a middle of those two things. And and I, I sort of like that. We did church across the street was the religious education there. And so I learned a lot about other religions, but I didn't learn a whole lot about Unitarianism. Um, and I'm not sure whether that was me or whether that was them, but but then I ended up uh, coming to Sandy Spring Friends School as a 15, almost 16 year old, and I said, you know, I'm a little emotional. Um, and I would often come to me for worship on Sundays. I was a boarding student, didn't particularly want to go home, which was a complicated place to be, and so I would often. Take, they bring a bus over until I come to meeting for worship, and I would listen to Raymond Havens, for those of you who know Raymond, um, uh, do his sermons, um, and and then walk back through through the woods. So this is my spiritual home, and I'm always grateful to be here. I'm not often able to be here now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a I'm a psychotherapist. Three days a week is my retirement job. Um, and I bring a lot of spirit into that work. I bring curiosity into that work. One of my favorite memes, I've got a little uh, a folder of memes in my phone. One of them is, everyone knows something I don't. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I'm here, because I know there are things that I will learn here today um, that I don't know. I'm so happy you're here, Adrian. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm Jenny Steyer. And uh, I walked into meeting in 2000. There was a workshop right after I came in, and the wild men and drummers were there. And they were really old. It's like they were like in their 70s. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so we are together <laughs> about all spiritual traditions and practices. Three of my closest friends are a Buddhist woman, a Muslim woman, and a Jewish woman. So I'm just delighted to be here and I'm bringing an open, grateful heart. I'm Bonnie Zimmer and I transferred my membership here about a year ago. Um, but I've been a Quaker for about 15 years. Um, and what I bring, uh, look at Francis. 
Um, what I bring today is a deep sense of physical fatigue as I recovered from cancer treatment this summer, and a sense that as I age, my sense of spirit moving in my life is changing. And I don't know quite what to make of that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what I bring today. Mm -hmm. Um, I am Joan Liverfidge, and I came in 1997, um, and um, we had a recommitment um, ceremony here at, I don't know when, 2013 or 2012. So we asked this meeting to take our marriage under its care. That was an important piece of being part of this meeting. Um, I um, have been a Quaker for 42 years, started at FMW. And um, what I appreciate about this circle is I've already learned so much about all these people that I've known for a long time. Um, so every time we sit together like this, it's, it's a wonderful experience. I bring hope and faith that this experience today will transform some of our conflicts and differences that we have and that we find unity as a community. Uh, unity in how we're called, Deborah said, as a community. Um, and, and the ability to work through our differences with love and compassion and, um, and be able to do repair with one another mm -hmm. sooner than later. <laughs> we either never do it at all or we do it two or three years later and things surface. Thanks, Joan. And um, I don't know, uh, as between Mariana and Ellen, who would like to go first? I can pick. Ah. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm Ellen Cronin, and I hope we remember to ask Jim also. <laughs> Um, to introduce himself. Uh, I grew up in a in Philadelphia yearly meeting uh, where the children were especially loved and um, encouraged to connect with God's spirit as they as we understood. Um, I took a 15 year break from friends and a late adolescent rebellion. And um, I've been at Sandy Spring since the mid 1980s. And S S Sandy Spring is my spiritual home. Um, I bring a, a lot of gratitude for this workshop already. As Joan said, you know, really getting to know where people are. And I have a special concern for all kinds of repair work, uh, reparative justice, and the repair that Joan referred to within our own meeting one-to-one -one. Uh, being able to come together in a loving unity. Um, and I have a hopeful curiosity about our being able to support one another in our leadings and ministry. I'm Mariana Gerritsen, and I, um, my family has been in this meeting for generations. I grew up coming to visit grandparents and coming to this meeting on Sundays when we were visiting grandparents. I moved to the area in 2016. By the time I moved to the area, I was already sick with chronic fatigue syndrome and mornings are hard for me, which is why I'm joining you from my bed. Um, and that means that I haven't been able to attend Sunday worship almost at all. Um, and uh, three years ago, I 
with the ebbs and flows of my illness and ebbs and flows in my marriage, I was coming into a really hard time. And my sister said, why don't you ask for a healing circle at the meeting? And I said, I haven't done enough for the meeting to ask for a healing circle from the meeting. And she said, bullshit. And I said, okay. <laughs> and um, so several of the people in this group helped me and have been on my healing circle for the last couple of years. And I have been on the most tremendous spiritual journey of my life these last couple of years. And um, I'm having a powerful experience of sort of feeling like I'm being called to some sorts of ministries as I figure out my life with this basic, with this disability. So I've not been able to be very engaged in the meeting, but would like to be more so, and um, I'm having a powerful experience in my own life of discerning um, gifts of ministry. And Jim, I wasn't sure, you can be as included or as not included as you want to be. I didn't want to make any assumptions either way. So if you want to sit and read and highlight and underline, <laughs> <laughs> like that is Fine. <laughs> you are already doing it. Worth it enough. I, I, yeah, I'm not included. Um, I'm Jim Webner. I've worked for Sandy Spring for three years. Um, I became a Quaker in 2016 in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, and I bring a semi distraction this morning because I'm trying to squeeze in Bible study prep while we're doing this for tomorrow, um, uh, but I am really interested in uh, Gifts of the Spirit, and this year I'm doing a, um, uh, a practicum in spiritual direction and um, uh, getting to uh, hear some, uh, hear the spiritual <coughs> with, uh, five directees that I have right now. Um, and that's really a wonderful gift. I, you know, I really love it. Um, <coughs> but but Andrew's here. We have this opportunity. Thank you so much. And thank you all. I feel like um, so I'm just meeting you, and it's so cool to learn these things about you. So I'm I'm very happy that you are having an opportunity to learn about each other and from each other even already. I appreciated Taddy's observation as a facilitator about time. And so that's always the balance, right? Now, introductions can go very quickly or they can be very uh, extensive, but I always think it's worth it to spend the time to invite people to share. It helps me as a facilitator to understand where you are. So things that I'm learning um, families are complicated, meetings are complicated, health is complicated, and there's a lot of joy and commitment and love in the room for each other and for the meeting and curiosity about what the next step is. Um, but as we go around the circle, so we, you will have time to be going around the circle, um, be mindful, please, of the time and also we'll have other types of triads and things like that where you'll have other opportunities to share. No time is wasted, but it is limited. So that's always the, the balance. I have my list of content, but honestly, if what happens in this meeting is that you get to know each other's journeys and, um, and concerns and cares better, that will be a successful time. And I hope to be able to share some of my, my prepared notes as well. Um, one thing, as questions come up, um, if they are questions that are bigger or not as directly related, I would ask that um, you write them during the break or during our small group stuff on the whiteboard, and that'll be our parking lot. I should have labeled it parking lot which always uh, so, seems so silly when I would see so it. It's like, that's clearly not a parking lot. That is a white um, <laughs> there, are, there are many things I don't know, but I do know how to recognize a parking lot. Um, thank you so much, Kendra. So Kendra's labeling that our parking lot. Um, 
if as you're in your small groups, you want to jot something down and stick it on the parking lot, I have post-it notes. So we'll have different opportunities to ask questions, but I actually put them up there because those are questions that I can maybe weave into different sections of the conversation um, or are bigger. And maybe we, we need to talk about other ways to explore them given our limited time. So I just wanted to say that. And now I'm gonna start talking about the reason that we're all here. So spiritual gifts. Um, I'm gonna give us a working definition and then talk about different ways of thinking about spiritual gifts. And then we're gonna have some opportunities to reflect on gifts that you see already in your meeting and, um, and share about that with each other. So that's kind of our roadmap for the next 35 minutes or so. So spiritual gifts are manifestations of God's grace and power that are poured out on individuals for the building up of beloved community. <clears throat> My working definition. I'm going to read it again because that was a lot of words. Spiritual gifts are manifestations of God's grace and power that are poured out on individuals for the building up of beloved community. So in that definition, there are a couple of things that spiritual gifts are not. Spiritual gifts are not rewards for being so special. <laughs> spiritual gifts are not things that you have so that you can lord it over other people and say, aren't I so much better than you? Spiritual gifts are not primarily for us as individuals. They're made to be shared with others. And spiritual gifts are fundamentally supernatural in their origin. There's a difference between learned skills and spiritual gifts. Big part of that difference is when and how and why we use them. We'll talk more about that. That's just a working definition. Any questions, comments, things that I'm missing that maybe should go into this before we kind of get into the different ways of thinking about it? Kendra. I think one of the things that came out of our workshop earlier, I think that's where it came from, was that if you're using your spiritual gifts, it brings you joy, as opposed to, oh, I have to do this again. Absolutely, absolutely. So over my years, I have learned how to set up meetings. I've learned how to coordinate calendars. It kills me every time I have to do it. It is not a spiritual gift. It's a skill, it's a thing I can do in a pinch. But I am quite clear that that's not what God calls me to do. Um, unless God is very, very, yeah. which I mm -hmm. do not believe. Yes. But sometimes the skills you learn support your spiritual gifts. A hundred. Oh, don't get ahead of my, don't get ahead of my agenda, Bonnie. Don't get ahead of my agenda, Bonnie. <laughs> So that is absolutely right. And so what, what, when we get to that point, we'll talk about how we can support each other in growth of spiritual gifts. And one way that we can do that is by identifying gifts and then pointing people to resources to develop. So I um, have a thing with people. Like I like people. I like interacting with people. And I've had years of training in conflict resolution and restorative practices. Mm -hmm. Those things are related. Um, I got the training because after I went to law school, I was like, I don't want to be a bank regulatory attorney. What am I doing here? <laughs> Why am I miserable all the time? Oh, it's because this is not what God is calling me to do. And so then I sought training and skills to become more effective in what I was already doing. So that's 100% true. In fact, we, if we're, if we're blessed, we will have opportunities to grow and to train, to refine the gifts that we already have mm -hmm. so that we can be more effective and faithful in using them well. But we'll get there. But yes, you're absolutely right. Bonnie's absolutely right. Bonnie, oh yes, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if this is, uh, falls under your sort of description of different language and holding space for different language, but I was really struck by your use of the preposition on that God's power and grace is on us as opposed to through us. And I didn't know if that was very intentional or purposeful or just a preposition. It was 
mostly a preposition, but I like, <laughs> but, but I think that that's, I think that that's, uh, you know, the, the power of the word was overall versus, you know, thinking about that George, it's not George Fox, because yeah, that's George Fox. 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 I'm, okay, there you go. I just need to go with my gun. Um, so the power of the word is overall means something different than the power of the word is through all means something different than the power of the Lord is in all. So the prepositions matter. And I like the through very much um, because when we are faithfully exercising our gifts, we are God's love made real in the world. Mm. Um, say that again. <laughs> <laughs> when we are faithfully exercising our gifts, we are God's love made real in the world. All that from our purpose. And this is being recorded, friends, if we didn't say. So that we can go back and re-listen and tell others who are here. <laughs> so let me quickly pull up my PowerPoint. Okie dokie. Now, hold on. Jimmy said I just I can screen share. No, should get it too. Very good. <clears throat> okay. Always that moment of suspense. Um so there are lots of different ways of looking at spiritual gifts. And <clears throat> we're going to talk about, okay. Could you put it in the slideshow? Yeah. There you go. Yeah, that'd be good. And absolutely. Never heard that before, right? <laughs> <laughs> like the comment, you know, we can see it better if it's a slideshow. Okay, let's see. Yeah. 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 There we go. Wow. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So this is what I mean when I say, if something's not working, please tell me, because we can we can do better. We can do better. Um, so there are lots of different models of spiritual gifts, and any one of these could be a weekend. Probably any one of these could be a week. But I'm going to just go through a few of them, and I have... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go through them and then you folks can ask questions. I would ask right now if you, for questions to be about like meaning and definition as opposed to what's the best framework. It's like, I don't think that there is a best framework. I think that they're, the lists are all good for different reasons and I'm rather eclectic. So some situations, some frameworks are better, some situations, other frameworks are better. But I want to just share some options so that as we go into our next se section, which is thinking about how these gifts appear in the meeting, we have some shared vocabulary. So traditional friends model, the old timey friends model is um, ministers who offer vocal ministry, either um, traveling among meetings or preaching evangelistically or both. They maybe did writing as well, public writing, to um, preach the gospel. Uh, elders who invited uh, friends into greater faithfulness, ideally, right? Ideally invited <laughs> friends into greater faithfulness, whether that was in their exercise of gifts of public ministry <laughs> or whether that was friends in the meeting, you know, um, in their less ideal forms, you know, cracking the whip to make sure that everybody got in line, which is why 75 years ago, roughly 75 to 100 years ago, uh, a lot of unprogrammed meetings laid down the practice of reporting or greatly scaled back, greatly scaled back the, pro uh, the process of recording gifts in ministry and re formally reporting elders. Um, it was largely the sense of ministry is like a, a two-tier membership among friends or ministers and everybody else, as well as power abuses by elders and the sense that it wasn't a real spiritual gift as much as it was like dynastic. Mm -hmm. 
that those practices were either laid down or greatly scaled back in the meetings that in the yearly meetings that retained them, at least among unprogrammed friends outside of the conservative tradition. Last but not least, overseers. We still have oversight committee caring for the like pastoral concrete needs of the meeting community. I'm gonna pause because for some folks, this is Quakerism 102. <laughs> and for other folks, it might be the first time you're ever hearing about any of this. Any questions about ministers, elders, and overseers? Okay. So then there are different lists um, in scripture. Romans 12 has a list. Prophecy, service, teaching, encouraging, giving, leading, mercy. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12 has a list. Words of wisdom, words of knowledge, so that's supernatural gifts of, um, of judgment or facts uh, from the spirit, gift of faith, gift of healing, gift of miracles. Um, interestingly enough, George Fox had a whole book of miracles that was like deliberately memory holds, which is kind of like an interesting thing. So it was like, oh, this will make us less credible. So we probably shouldn't talk about all this supernatural miracle mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. um, which I find interesting. I'm like, yeah. that's got levels, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. It's got levels. Mm -hmm. um, gift of prophecy, discernment of spirits. It's like sometimes somebody's talking to you and like they, the words that they're saying all sound fine, but you're like, mm, there's something uh, off, unwholesome, ill about what you're saying, even though what you're saying sounds fine, but there's something in it that feels off than speaking and interpreting tongues. Um, there are gift inventories, so I'm going to just pop up on the screen in a minute. The 30 gifts from the Three Gifts of Ministry book. Um, so put a pin in that. Um, and then Ephesians 4, which is like a favorite framework of mine, because it really talked about how the gifts function together in community. And so you've got the apostolic gift, which is starting new ministries, starting new networks in response to new needs, the prophetic gift, which really points us to how is God calling us in this moment? How is God calling us to faithfulness? Um, the evangelistic gift, noticing who's not at the table and like going out to get them. <laughs> um, the shepherding gift, uh, which is that love for the people who are already here. Like how do we have a community that's warm and caring? And uh, the teaching gift, which is, you know, what basically helping people understand spiritual truth and, re and, and, and reality, oftentimes in a more systematic way than the prophet who's like, they got their thing mm -hmm. um, or they've got their message. Whereas the teacher's like, you know, we also need a framework to be operating in that's sound and shared and true. Um, and so here's that 30 gifts of 30 colors of ministry list. Now I understand I got a list in an attachment from somebody named Betsy Myers, who I don't know, but it's a great list. This is why this uh, list appeared in my inbox. <laughs> And then there is an, a beautifully updated spiritual gifts right. catalog that Betsy has put together that we have available on PDF that she said we can share. So that was, I was going to put that on the parking lot of who had that. I was going to write it down and that time now. So is this the latest one from Betsy? Yep. So gorgeous. The 30 colors, these all of these are in the 30 colors. The ones that are in bold are in Betsy's list. Okay. And so the and the the uh, parentheses are where she has a slightly different name. Mm -hmm. Okay, but the catalog is great, and the catalog. One of the things that makes the catalog great is it has kind of like reflection questions that will help you identify these gifts as they show up in the meeting. Thirty Colors of Ministry uh, book got released under a new title, Thirty Colors of Gifts, which is hilarious because I spent years thinking, oh, it's out of print. I can never find it. I will never find it again. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, oh, no, no, they just reissued it with a different title. Um, and so it goes into detail. It has a page on about each one of these gifts. But, um, but basically, you see that this is a lot more, um, there's a lot broader variety 
than what you see in the scriptural list based on kind of what, what we see in life, right? There are people who are skilled artists and gifted artists, and then there are people who use their art to connect, to invite us into connection with the spirit or as an expression of their connection to spirit. Mm -hmm. We're talking about that difference between a gift and a skill or gift and a talent and a, um, like a natural talent. Um, people who use craftsmanship, they either make or fix things uh, in order to offer that to the community. Um, gift of giving. So there's some people who, you know, they, they have these profiles of these, you know, they'll be like a second grade teacher or like two second grade teachers who've been married for 30 years. And then they like give away a million dollars in scholarships. And you're like, one, where did you get this million dollars? And two, wow. Those people who give with that joyful spirit are like, wow, you're really, and, and they love to do it. Um, and they love to, to offer their resources to others very similar to the gift of hospitality in a different way, creating those welcoming spaces. Um, gift of mercy often looks like this in the same the gift of knowledge and the gift of teaching sometimes get confused, but the difference is that teachers actually teach. <laughs> the gift of knowledge, you just know. Um, so you might go to that person with a specific question, but you're highly unlikely to be like, oh, teach this course. And they're not gonna necessarily want to because they don't have that desire to impart knowledge, but they do have that, um, mind that, that wants to know. Um, I don't want to, again, this could easily be a weekend and actually have the 30 on the, on, on the three gifts. Um, so I will ask, instead of trying to go through each one necessarily, because some I think are fairly self-explanatory, are there questions about any of these that feel like, oh, what does that mean? That's not, that's not super clear. Singleness. Mm -hmm. So that is, there's a question. If you look at the Betsy at Betsy's catalog, she I don't think considers that a gift. She considers that a spiritual discipline. Mm -hmm. But the under the three colors framework, they say, you know, there's some people who um are really called to devote their lives to service in beloved community without the distractions of spouse and family. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. um, any other questions? I have to say, I have another catalog that I'll send to John and maybe she can send both of them out. Maybe you can write it in the third one. What's the name? <laughs> what? I can't remember. Jan, somebody. Oh, Jan Wood. Yes, Jan Wood. So Jan Woods is very, I was super fortunate. 12 years ago to um to go to she did a workshop on spiritual gifts at Powell House which is New York Healing Meetings Retreat Center um wonderful <laughs> a lot of overlap with this 30 colors list um so she had the descriptions in that catalog in that um she has brief descriptions and she has a longer description about um gifts within the context oh, within the larger context beautiful 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 there are like three documents that go really together when you send those out joan can you send them to me? <laughs> yeah awesome well <laughs> we need to get everybody yeah okay we need, we need everybody's email right okay so we'll uh i have maybe during the break we can put that out and then before folks leave you can write down oh <laughs> I don't have like your emails, so I'll just call it Feminist Center. I'm telling you, it's a he just sits there <laughs> and then yes. comes at the right moment. But yes, you had a, a well, I'm just organization. I'm interested to understand how uh, suffering um, is uh, part of this list as it affects an individual ministry and a communal ministry. I can tell you about something. So um, when I uh, when my son was a little bit under two years old I was already super burned out at the big law firm in Midtown. That was, 
I, I liked my job fine. But as I tell people, if you're doing something for 60 hours a week, mm -hmm. liking it fine is really not enough. Mm -hmm. You got to love it or it will kill you. Okay, so I, I asked for a clearness committee in my meeting to discern whether I should go to seminary or what my next play should be, because I was like, it's not here. What's the next thing? So we were talking about whether I should go to seminary. One member of my clearness committee was like, well, you know, it might be, seminary might be the right path, because I've been talking about chaplaincy, I've been talking about spiritual direction. Um, but she's like, you know, as friends, we have other ways of recognizing ministry things like recording. And I was like, oh, does, I don't, I don't know, does New York Yearly Meeting record gifts of ministry? I don't know. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, you know, um, it might be something worth looking into. So I'm talking on the phone with a friend of mine who's been, grew up in the meeting. I was like, you know, this came up in my fairness committee. Is there someone that I should talk to about this? And I, I don't even know, do we even record gifts of ministry? And she's like, oh yeah, you should talk to so-and-so on MNC. So I emailed so-and-so and I said, hey, you know, this came up in my clearness committee. I was just wondering, like, does New York Yearly Meeting have a process? Do we record gifts of ministry? Is this even a thing that we do? Because I know some yearly meetings do and some don't. And, you know, so-and-so suggested that I talk to you about it. And so we're at meeting for worship. She kind of takes me aside after meeting, closes the door to the library <laughs> and dresses me down. I left the meeting in tears or close. Mm -hmm. I'm so disappointed in you. This is a, you know, really a lack of maturity on your part. Mm -hmm. You know, you like, it's very out of line to ask to be recorded. I'm like, I'm not asking to be recorded. I'm asking if we have a process because this came up in my clearness committee, what is happening? I later found out that many people would have left the meeting over that. I was devastated because she was somebody I really, really looked up to, admired, was like, I'm going to be like you and think or what kind of thing. Um, I'm still emotional about it. But the fact that I could take that painful experience and then leverage it in, as I continued my spiritual journey and use it as like a teaching moment in a context like this, mm -hmm. gift of suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Transformation. Exactly. Transforming suffering. Exactly. Redeeming suffering. Redeeming suffering. I mean, I thought of Joe. Sure. Sure. Well, no thanks for this ministry of suffering. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, send that back to the kitchen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, That is not what I ordered. Yeah. I wanted the meatloaf. Thank you, Wendy. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. I, just keep... <laughs> I actually have something to say about suffering that, um, so yes. I, I understand, I hear that experience and um, that resonates. And also I was thinking about, you know, the people who, um, you know, in, in my work, people call me because they're suffering. Um, and um, it is a gift to me, sometimes it's a burden. Sometimes I suffer, and sometimes I suffer other people suffering. But it's also a gift to me to be invited in to someone else's suffering, mm -hmm. to have the opportunity to be curious about their suffering. Just yesterday, I was on a call with someone who's probably 15 years younger than I am, and she was uh, really considering leaving her meeting. Um, and I know her meeting. Um, and... You know, it was it was not my role to tell her not to leave, but it was my role to say, I will not abandon you. And I think that that's what she needed to hear. Like, it was like the air changed mm -hmm. between us when I said, I will not abandon you. Because what she was suffering with was feeling abandoned mm -hmm. by her meeting and wanting to run away from this pain. But her gift, her, I mean, it doesn't sound like a gift, but the gift she had been given in really feeling what it was like to be in her meeting and having words for it and having an elder, you know, 15 years older than she is, I'm an elder in her life, like many of you are an elder in my life, having an elder she could go to and share in that created something new. It was like from the suffering 
was creation and the opportunity for rebirth. And so that is one of the ways that I see suffering being a gift is not suffering alone, suffering in solidarity and the creative, the creative power of finding the right person, people to reach out to. Yeah. Oh. oh, oh. Sorry. Oh, I was going to point out. Was yes, gonna thank you so much, because my back is to the screen. Ellen, please. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. This is actually a response to um, the Quaker models of um, spiritual gifts, as well as these lists. Um, it's not traditional, but there are younger young members of our, and attenders of our meeting who have introduced the idea of youngering. Uh, <laughs> our children are can be our best teachers. That's certainly true with my daughter um, when, when she was growing up. And, but I'm hearing the word youngering from, uh, and I, suggest that as an alternative to eldering. Andrea. What you just talked about, the story you just told us, I guess epitomizes one of the things I hope that we can do as a meeting, which is to, to know the spiritual gifts that are available within the meeting mm -hmm. and and to be able to nominate people to committees that go with their spiritual gift and to know who to go to with this particular problem mm -hmm. because that's their gift and i just think it would provide so much more richness and i feel like we're people who come together and do stuff. But I don't feel like we're spiritually connected. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? I want to just point to something that you said in that one that's going to take us into our next activity. Mm -hmm. So, oh, um, but two, one of the things that all of these that identifying gifts requires is really knowing each other deeply. <clears throat> Sorry, one of the things that naming and supporting gifts requires is knowing each other deeply. Mm -hmm. Knowing each other deeply. So some gifts are very obvious, right? Um, if somebody is giving, you know, vocal ministry, it's like every time they stand up, you're like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be good. There are those people where you're like, oh, oh, I can't wait to hear what comes through you. Through you, appreciate the attention to the preposition. <laughs> um, I can't wait to hear what God says through you to us. This is going to be great. That's a very, it's a gift exercise in a public way that you can see that's kind of more obvious. But uh, you'll see a lot of these gifts are not as obvious. So like that um, missionary gift and what they're really talking about in the three colors for missionary is like cross-cultural communication. Yeah. Can you translate spiritual concepts from your culture to another culture in a way that is heard and understood. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's a gift that you're not necessarily going to see in the meeting if you share the cultural context of the person with the gift. People outside of the meeting will see it, but you won't see it unless maybe you travel with them in ministry or they're offering a workshop and you go and you're like, oh, this is a evangelical church and yet you're talking about things and that I recognize from our Quaker meeting and they're actually getting it that's amazing um or gifts of uh the gift of helps you know or assistance a lot of those times people who are really gifted and saying like in in recognizing you have a need how can I help you have a ministry how can I facilitate to magnify the impact of your ministry people are just like oh they're so nice so I don't necessarily realize like that's a gift that's a gift. And so we have to know each other um, maybe more deeply than we often have time to. I'm just going to say a little bit more about spiritual gifts, and then I'm going to release you into your triads. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down here. 
Slow down here. Okay. Um, the Ephesians 4 gifts, like I mentioned before, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the shepherd, and the teacher, I find these get this framework helpful because we talk it because it really takes the gifts. It's very clear on the connection between like the individual gift and how it impacts the community. And so those people with the apostolic gifts, forming new ministries, forming new initiatives, creating new networks are energetic. They encourage us to be responsive. People with the prophetic gift encourage us to be faithful, to take leaps of faith. I know this is hard, but I feel like this is where God is calling us. Um, the evangelist reminds us that like sometimes welcoming in new people is hard. It disrupts the dynamic. If we like our community, new people can be threatening. And also, the good shepherd isn't the one who, you know, hangs out with the 99 sheep and says, you know, forget you lost sheep. Good luck. Don't let the door hit you on the keister on the way out. Like, that's not the good shepherd. The good shepherd is the one who goes out and finds that lost sheep. The shepherd is the one who cares for, who, you know, encourages that environment of caring. And the teacher is the one who keeps us grounded in a tradition, in a faith, and not just like a bunch of people doing their own thing. And so there are all these different gift lists. I'm going to go back to the three colors list because it's oh, pretty. Yeah, 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 absolutely. The apostle would be Annette Breeling, who started the two friend school. <laughs> <laughs> In case you don't know her. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back to this list because this list is very inclusive. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to invite everyone um and maybe jim maybe we can get a, a zoom room for mariana and ellen sure um a, a breakout room uh why don't we go ahead and pass these around in that direction and i'll give some around this direction one for each. so one for each and just hang on to your card and i will give you instructions <laughs> and does anyone need a pen? Okay, I'm not gonna ask. A lot of people, I'm like, whatever. If there are extra pens at the end, we'll have extra pens at the end. So while you are, does anybody else need a pen? And we have our cards. Okay. So what I want to do, I'm going to set my phone timer. Leaving this gifts list up. Oh, that actually is, that actually might be a problem. Uh, Mariana or Ellen, if you could take a screenshot, because I think once you're in the Zoom room, you won't have access to the screen share. But I want, I'm going to set my timer and give you five minutes to look at this list and think about the people in your meeting and in your committees who you served with. Can you identify anybody who's got these gifts? Like as many as you can. Okay. Okay. It doesn't have to be with a hundred percent certainty. Yeah. But just like, oh yeah, that person. Oh yeah, that person. So yes. Jim may need to tell Ellen and Mariana how to do a screenshot. They may not know off the top of their head. Mariana, Mariana. Mariana's got it. I've done it. I have a screenshot. Okay. Yeah, only um when he puts them in the breakout room, that's gonna go away and you'll yeah, be able to see them. They may not know how to do it. They do. They've already got the picture, but but thank you because that would be a disaster for sure. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna start the timer now. We got five minutes. And um actually don't put well. We can take that down so we can see. You can go and you can put them in the screenshot, but take the first five minutes for uh for writing. And then we're going to have some more time for reflecting with each other. Wow. <laughs> wow. I think I'm just going to do one for the Yeah. Oh, let me go ahead. Um, 
doesn't have to be exhaustive. Just even if you have one or two people where you're like, oh, this, oh, that. Ellen, are, are you not able to clean the rooms, the breakout rooms? Oh, but um, you were maybe not doing that quite yet. Mm -hmm. well, wasn't that just so that they could have the groups that were actually going to go into? I want to try to get into the group. They don't have to be able to do this or not, but you will be. Oh, I'm sorry. It's coming. Mm -hmm. It's coming. You want to close it in Catherine, I've got you down the chip gas now. I don't have to tell me what they are. <laughs> All right, so we've got two minutes. Maybe you can be in the triad together and compare your groups. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Wrap that up. <laughs> it's okay. This is just a taste. This is just a teaser. Thir 30 is a long list, and so we're not expecting you to have like one a person for each gift or a gift for each person, but just as a way of starting to get started. So I want to invite you now. It's okay if you don't feel finished. You should not feel finished. You should not feel finished. <laughs> so I'm going to invite you now with, I'm not going to count you off because we're all big kids. We can do this. But I'm going to invite you to get into groups of two or three because we don't have quite the right number for all triads, three preferred, two in a pinch, and um, share your list with each other and share your experience of writing the list. And then if anything else, any other names come up, you can jot those down too. No one's collecting this, but I want you to have a chance to share kind of what it was like and any names, any additional names that arise. So I'm gonna start my timer. How long do you have? So I'm going to give us eight minutes just because it feels like a nice okay. day. <laughs>
You'll, we'll be getting back together. Our break is getting pushed a little tiny bit. So you will, uh, you might, you can get together with the same people in a minute. Um, so how was that? It sounds like fun. It's validating. It really are gifts here. It's challenging. There's more gifts than we can even name, or I mean, I'm so much. What's to think about it? So now, Debbie, I, I hear you saying a little bit. It was so. So you said, Patty, it's validated. We said we've got. We know we have real gifts in the meeting, uh -huh. which is exciting. But you were saying it's challenging. Yeah, I mean, the sea of, of names and faces just sort of kept. You know, and I'm thinking, I'm missing, I'm missing people, you yeah. know, you know, that I know were important. And I was like, there's this, there was just sort of a sea of names and faces and try to sort through, uh oh, because there's so many gifts. Yeah, yeah I, I needed to look at the members list. I have a hard time recalling names, you know, and that's it was so, yeah. so to me. If, if somebody else might mention things, yes, I agree with that. <laughs> yes, but, but not to bring the name forward and say, ah, oh, the one's on the list. So one of the things that is like, it's a good thing no one person has the responsibility for all of this, but what would it look like to come together and kind of take responsibility as a meeting for noticing gifts in others? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kendra, Kendra. Well, just the power of different points of view at the same time. Mm. Because we each have a group of people that we know. Mm -hmm. Right. More or less well. Mm -hmm. no, I don't think any of us knows everybody in this meeting really well. It's a huge group. So that's really everyone you just said. To, and so not just having somebody is known by any, every, mm, everybody. Right. Somebody is known by everybody is known by somebody. <laughs> Everybody's known by somebody, but also to have multiple people reflecting on the same people and being able to share their different perspectives. Um, Mariana, Ellen, did you have anything? How was it in, in, in your group? I was just going to comment on that in particular. You know, I said, wow, it was really hard for me to think about identifying somebody else's gifts. And then I said, these are the gifts that I identified for Joan Liversitch. And Ellen said, those are the exact same three things that I had written down for Joan Liversitch. Wow. And that felt really powerful. So. Okay, okay. Thank you for that. I'm, there's like, there was like an energy in the room as you were talking. And so now I'm like, oh, what do we do with this energy? So I'm, I'm going to ask Michael and then Kendra. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, found, I found myself and find myself wondering how interesting it would be if as many meeting members we could get together. And then in that uh, workshoppy kind of way where you say, okay, everybody who feels like they have a gift. So mm -hmm. we are asked to identify our own gifts in listening, in mm -hmm. healing, in art, would gather together and have certain spots for, and then and then move from one spot to another. Like, what's another gift that you feel like you have? Oh, and people, yeah, people would sort of be, out. okay, I'm with my people yeah. around yeah. listening, I'm with my people around organization um, as we move through it. And so, so a suggestion for a follow-up might be to take one of these lists, you will have all gone through this experience together. So maybe there are a few people who might want to share from one of the catalogs the different descriptions and do a two-parter. One, where you practice identifying gifts in each other, and maybe that looks like index cards with different members' names on it. And you can just like pass the cards around and write down like, oh, what do you identify? Or like put a check. If like four people put a check next to prophecy, I get prophecy. Mm -hmm. Um, and share that back with each other. And then the next part might be if you feel like you might have a gift or 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 you'd like to explore that, because there are some mm -hmm. of these gifts. I think when I did the three colors gift inventory, what's nice about that is that it does five active gifts. How is God already using you in your community? In your community, and then it does five latent gifts. What are things that maybe you should explore? Because maybe if you stretched yourself in that direction, you would find that you have a gift. 
my top gift was evangelism. I had lived in Georgia for a few years, and my experience of evangelism in Georgia was uh, waiting in the lunch line for my turkey tetrazzini and getting tapped on the shoulder by somebody asking me if Jesus Christ was my Lord and Savior. And I was oh. like, I literally just want lunch. I just want lunch. I don't want to be having this conversation right now. I am from New Jersey. This is not how we interact with each other. <laughs> Okay, that was just my, and so, so when I got that as my top latent gift, I was like, absolutely not, and will not be speaking of this for um, and also it was completely accurate, yeah. so sometimes maybe you have the gift that there are other reasons why you're like, okay, it either, op um, you haven't had an opportunity, or you have your own kind of stuff, around the gift. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, it could be very beneficial to invite people to explore. It's like, oh, you know, maybe this gift gives you like a weird feeling. Maybe you should be talking to those people who are exercising that gift and see if it's as weird as you think it is. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't sound like that. Uh, <laughs> see if it's different than how you thought is what I meant to, how I meant to put it. Um, so just to ask a very like realistic, how are we doing question? Do we need a break now or can we go till 11? If we need a break now, that's okay. A couple of people are taking care of themselves. So the, let's let's just go a little bit more because I want to close out the portion on gifts before we, and, and so that when we come back from the break, we can get the use of Yeah, absolutely. When we did spiritual gifts at Spring Farm, we had the generous list and people each went independently and checked off what they thought different people had. Mm -hmm. And when I looked at my list, I realized that there was a lot of agreement. When I went back a month or two later, I realized a lot of those things were learned skills. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be sort of a check-in by somebody, mm -hmm. you know, Thinking about it maybe in advance, or maybe thinking of it as a part of a, a workshop just about that. So, in so when I did the um, weekend workshop, and that was in the context of Friends of Jesus Fellowship on spiritual gifts, uh, eight years ago, what we did is we sent out the list along with the we sent out the spiritual gift inventory. There's like a check in the three colors of get of ministry uh book. There's like a questionnaire. It is insane. It's like 120 questions. It's mm -hmm. a lot. Um, but we sent it out in advance and scored it in advance and sent out the results in advance so that when we came back together, we could focus mm -hmm. in, break people into groups with similar gift clusters, and they could have that kind of connection. So depending on You can kind of do as much. There is no upper limit to the amount of energy that you can put into this exploration. The question is kind of what's the relative balancing? So there is some benefit in doing that work in advance. You have a wonderful benefit because you're meeting. You're not coming together for a workshop where you're like, we have three days to get it all done. Do you want to, if, if 2025 is going to be your year of naming and lifting up gifts, you could do it all year long mm -hmm. and go amazing places with each other. Mm -hmm. And if you, I know you have friendly eights groups in the meeting, you could do, you know, rejigger the friendly eights groups around gift clusters. You could have a book group where you explore this and you're meeting every month and you're talking about it and doing homework in between and checking in. How was that for you? You know, you were gonna explore this gift of prayer and how's your prayer practice going? There are all kinds of things that could that could happen. Yes, Adria, when we serve on nominating committee, it's mm -hmm. an amazing opportunity because we sit there four, five, six people and you wonder about the people and their gifts, and then you reach out to them and you listen. And the job is to match the gifts with the opportunity. So that is something that I think is going on all the time. So that is, and I'm so glad that you said that. We're going to have a 
a question just um, in a few minutes about how you're already identifying and nurturing gifts. Mm -hmm. Folks I know who served on nominating committees in different meetings have had wildly different experiences between like, oh, we think deeply about people's gifts and then we connect them to opportunities to exercise them. And then we have eight slots and we need a warm body in the slot. You know, you have a pulse. Congratulations. Yes. <laughs> you were alive and you didn't say no. So congratulations. <laughs> so it's a live question, and I think it depends from meeting to meeting, but but we will have a chance to talk about that. Yeah, Bonnie. I think another question might be is how do gifts change or manifest differently mm -hmm. as people age or mature in their spiritual life? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so sometimes you might be in a different phase or in a different context and one gift comes to the fore. Mm -hmm. And then you change context or you're in a different phase of your life and that gift recedes. So maybe it recedes and there's like a fallow period where you're like, I don't know, I give so. Mm -hmm. or maybe something else comes forward that you wouldn't have otherwise expected. And so I think that's a really important question. When you talk about uh, there, are, you know, friends, we love our flow charts for some reason. Um, there's a flow chart on like the life cycle of ministry that I think also applies to spiritual mm -hmm. gifts. And one phase in life cycle of ministry is laying it down. Mm -hmm. And it's okay to say that was a gift that was manifested at that time in my life. And it isn't now. And that doesn't mean that I did something wrong. And it doesn't mean that I'm less than I was. It just means I was there then and I'm in a different place now. Sometimes I think if you have exercised gifts and received external validation, or even just that feeling of like faithfulness of like, oh, I did the right thing, we could become very identified with the gifts that we're carrying. Mm -hmm. But the gifts are always on loan and they're not for our benefit. And as long as we're doing what we can do in a faithful way, then we're more than enough. Yeah. It's also called rents. There are times when I think it was energy to do something. Um, and so taking a break is also a way of making sure that there, there are enough resources to do something. But I am I am also aware that in different Quaker cultures, um, meetings or nominating committees or whatever function in different ways. And there was one time in Kenya where where we were we were trying to figure out um, who had the gift to do certain things. And one of the Quaker pastors in Kenya said, oh, we just identify that who it is to go tell them, you have this gift, so you should do this, <laughs> rather than this kind of internal deliberation that goes on. It's a couple of people would go and say, you should be doing this. And, and it's, it's, there are different ways of doing it. In a big meeting like ours, a lot of times, it's slots to fill versus where are the gifts that appear in different places. And that's what we will be talking about tomorrow, right? <laughs> how do we always, always how do we match <laughs> and slots available for those gifts? Absolutely. And so I'm just gonna say go back into like teaching teaching mode just to just to say a couple more things about gifts. And then we'll talk a little bit more about how you're already nurturing gifts, and then we'll take a break. Um, I've been looking at those grapes, and they look like <laughs> so plump and delicious. And I'm like, mm, I'm coming for you, grapes. They don't know. <laughs> they're, they're on borrowed time. Um, so we were talking about gifts, and one of the difference between gifts and skills, right, is that one, Exercising our gifts, faithfully exercising our gifts will give us joy. It's a life-giving as opposed to life-draining mm -hmm. activity. Mm -hmm. But also people will live out their gifts whether or not they're acknowledged or supported. Mm -hmm. And people with prophetic gifts stumble into exercising gifts of prophecy all the time. I, I certainly have. Or I'm like, I just, I'm going to ask an innocent question. And then like, every, and you're just like, whoa, what happened here? Mm -hmm. Um so like somebody, and you know, I've had, for example, uh, 
there was a situation, I've seen several situations where someone with a teaching gift, someone has a teaching gift. So they will collect and systematize knowledge. They will write uh, essays that nobody reads, um, but they write it because they have, they have to. They, it's just, it, it, um, you plant the seed and you get the flower. It's not going to you know, give you a Ferrari no matter how many seeds you plant. It's just going to grow into what it is. Um, but the role of the meeting, then the meeting has an impact on whether the gift is used well or poorly. So if you have someone with that teaching gift, a meeting could encourage that. They could, um, they could invite that person into opportunities to deepen their knowledge of Quaker faith and practice, and then invite them to help with developing adult religious ed. And then now everybody in the meeting benefits from the person's teaching gift. Or they can ignore the gift, not provide a space for an outlet, not um, nurture a shape for the gift. And that person will get up in meeting for worship and they will do a 10 minute or 12 minute mini lecture on something that you are probably not interested in, but they are very interested in. And people will feel like, why does this person always do this? And it's gonna feel like a hostage situation um, because it's like, we're stuck here and they're lecturing at us. Or that person might do the same thing. And then you elder them. Well, you know, in meeting for you talk an awful lot. Maybe you should be doing some more discernment about whether or not that spirit led. And that person maybe leaves the meeting. Um, or maybe they're just deeply, deeply hurt because they're trying to give an offering and it's being thrown on the ground and trampled on. So maybe they come, but then they withdraw internally because they've understood that what they have to offer is not welcome or accepted. And I use that, oh yeah, go ahead, go ahead. What you just outlined, I think, is a process of assuming we know what someone is doing. Mm -hmm. Instead of using eldering as an opportunity to ask questions, mm -hmm get more information, work with somebody else, not do it by yourself, not speak on behalf of the meeting by yourself, which we heard about not that long ago in meeting for worship. <clears throat> but learn before you tell somebody what you think they should be doing or not doing. I'm like getting chills. What you said, that first part that you said felt so true. Like, I assume I know what you're doing. Oh, you don't know what meeting for worship is about. You don't understand what the rules of the road are. Let me tell you why what you're doing is wrong and doesn't fit with what we're doing here. As opposed to, what was that like for you? Oh, you felt, oh, you're going into this. You're reading a lot of Brian Drayton. You're reading a lot of Bill Tabor. You're reading a lot of, huh. Well, that's really, really interesting. And here's a book that might be helpful for you. And by the way, you know, um, we've got a nominating committee meeting coming up and we got some slots. <laughs> I wonder if um, you might be interested in sharing some of what you're learning with the meeting in another forum where you have actual time and space to to invite people into engagement. Mm -hmm. And so this is kind of like, um, we threw away eldery, but of course we didn't really. What we did was become very bad. <laughs> <laughs> Do it informally in a disorganized way and not necessarily with intention or coordination. Um, so, then what, so, so what we see is when gifts are not supported, people can feel demoralized, they can feel useless, but when there's no accountability, people can, either hurt others if they're not exercising their gifts well, or they get burned out because they don't have, I mean, when I asked for uh, convene a ministry support committee for me, I said, you know, the number one thing I'm relying on you guys for <laughs> is to help me say no. Because there's always something that you could be doing and it will be a worthwhile thing. It'll be a valuable thing, but you cannot do everything. So we have to have accountability for each other. Um, friends have traditionally believed that God doesn't ask us just to wait for heaven in the afterlife, but that if we follow the light today, the kingdom of heaven can be made real now. And so an important function of the meeting is to acknowledge, support, and nurture the wholesome exercise of gifts so that that vision of the kingdom of heaven, of beloved community, 
a blessed connection and communion can be made a reality now. Mm -hmm. Because as you said, Patty, the gifts are here. It's not like they're not. So how do we then create channels where they can be exercised effectively for the good of everyone? And the, including the good of people who haven't gotten here yet. Mm -hmm. um, so nominating committee, I wanna just invite us to share a little bit. Um, nominating committee was named as like one, um, one uh, way that we have for nurturing and identifying gifts. Are there other spiritual technologies <laughs> um, or tools or strategies? Clearness committees. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we got nominating committee, clearness committees. My capitalization is going to be very, uh, let's just call it very uh, 17th century. Maybe yes, maybe no. Um, maybe everything, maybe nothing. Other other ways, other ways. I want to ask about clearness committees because I had a horrible experience with one. Okay. Do we, as a body, know how to do a nurturing clearness committee? Because the one I had was very damaging. And I've heard about others. Do we have this knowledge or do we need... Training about this. It's Some meetings have that knowledge. I had a clearance committee when I was getting ready to be a whistleblower that ended up turning into a worship group that met for 25 years. That one. Ah. You can answer the question again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are some. Um, so, yeah, it's a tool, but we may not. We don't have all the skills so, to use it well. Yeah, yeah. Some some have the skills and some don't, Maybe. and that's part of the discernment. Figuring yeah. out is is this group able to help somebody else get clear about something, or is it a direction committee? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the big. Yeah. What is a clearness committee? Right. And some people right. view it, Kendra. I don't know in your case. As it's an opportunity to give you advice and tell you what I we yeah. think you should do. Right. That is not my understanding of what a clearance committee is. Right. And, and we have to be reminding each other and having some structure every time we do it. Yeah. I'm a big structure person. Okay. Yeah. But but it's important and, and 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 just one thing to flag, a lot of the stuff that we do as friends is very countercultural. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when we have our business meetings, very countercultural. And if we're not careful, the culture will come in and hijack our does. practices. Yeah. 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 I don't know whether it's a current hand, but it looks like Ellen's. <laughs> I, I, I need to sit like this. Yes, Ellen. Thank you. Um, another brief example. In the late 80s, I had a leading um, that Sandy Spring meeting should have a healing light prayer circle. And I and four beloved uh, long term friends sat with me. All of them said, no, Sandy Spring is not ready for that now. Mm -hmm. And I felt. Um, I felt deeply loved and accepted by all four of them. Mm. What came out of it was the Thursday midweek meeting for worship. <laughs> so you see how these topics, we're gonna we're gonna have our break and I'm just like, how is it already 11? We're gonna have our break and then we're gonna come back and talk about meetings. But, but you see, um, these topics, they're not like bright lines in between them. They flow into each other. Gifts, leadings, ministry support. Um, did you have something, Michael? Then? No. Did our, okay, yeah. Um, on this question, I, it's really basic, but simply getting to know each other. Yeah. You, you know, if you don't know somebody, you don't know what their gifts are. Mm -hmm. 
So opportunities to get to know one another more deeply mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. seems just pretty basic. Well, but that's really difficult to do in a large meeting mm -hmm. other than with whatever your kind of group is. You know, it's it's uh, a large meeting balkanizes to some extent. You know, it it, it comes together in small groups. Mm -hmm. but so, yeah, so, so maybe, well, I was, yeah, I was thinking because it's not along the lines of what Deborah and Richard just saying. Our our fellowship time after meeting with with a simple meal has become more intentional about. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can stay here and learn from each other after worship because in the worship experience, we hear a few messages, but then it's afterwards that we can meet each other more deeply and um, share more superficially and deeply. <laughs> and, and that's part of the role of adult religious education yeah. programs that we're running on the second and the fourth mm -hmm. and first days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Adrian, every time somebody shows up for a meeting, a newcomer, that is a huge opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to reach out to a couple of people that don't come here anymore. But still, um, just reaching out to newcomers and saying, this is who we are, mm -hmm. and getting to know them is such a wonderful way to give them an opportunity to either come back or understand us. Absolutely. And thank you for saying that and for being proactive in that. A lot of meetings struggle mightily with that. So it's awesome that folks are being intentional. Um, I'm going to go to Wendy and then Kendra. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I'm glad that we're doing this kind of imagining because um, the only thing I could say we currently do is we have a nominating committee and we know about clearness committees. Um, and so, <laughs> yes, we know what they are. Um, and actually, to, to your point, Deborah, about the sort of, I feel like in order to do a good job of identifying and nurturing gifts, we have to be curious about our own culture. Um, I think that, you know, what we're talking about in this space and what we've talked about many times when we weren't here, Adria, is, you know, that um, we do things to each other um, to prevent the expression of gifts, mm -hmm. that, you know, we, we are a part of the outside world. I, I know I am. Um, and... Um, and so, you know, having more religious education, having more spiritual deepening experiences that open us up to see things about ourselves that maybe we see the outline of, but not enough of to really address yet, mm -hmm. is a step towards identifying spiritual gifts and moving forward. Well, it is. Not to take too much of our time before our break, but the yeah, sorry. The um so I, I only met all of you in the last two years. <laughs> and I think this is sort of something that well, just since since someone brought up welcoming newcomers, uh it it wasn't hard for me necessarily, but it was strange or I don't know what my, my experience of trying to get to know people here and this is not a criticism but a lot of people came to me and asked me with real curiosity what I why I was here what I'm doing not not to be like what are you doing here and how dare you but to be like let me find out what you're doing here and I hardly knew at the time myself <laughs> And so it was just a little bit, I don't know, it was a little bit tricky to sort of, and then and then it happened many times after many, over many weeks, and I developed a sort of non-answer, <laughs> um, but, uh, but it was a little bit 
it was a little bit curious, and I, it really took me back the first couple of times that it happened. And I just since someone brought it up, I'll say, I wonder what it is, what the impression that people get who are who have not stuck it out. Um, <laughs> I wonder what the impression that they get is because I think I think we're very good at having like we all have done a lot of thinking about who we are and why we're here and what we get out of it. But I think potentially the way that we have interacted with people who are coming for the first time or the second time assumes that they've been able to do the same things when maybe they're not and they don't have such good answers. And so that so so there's a, maybe a sweet spot between ignoring somebody or just waving sure. from across the room and being like maybe overly well, creating a, a, a situation of maybe unintentional pressure. Yeah, well, and, and and my experience here was a lot better than I went the first two or three times I went to meeting for worship where I had Delphi mm -hmm. years before I came here. And the first time I went to Delphi, someone asked, oh, how did you end up here? And I, you know, gave some answer that was more about logistics. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> you're right. right. <laughs> well, I, 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 I met the University of Maryland, so I drove down from Kansas. And, oh, right. <laughs> and we went back and forth a little bit, and someone says, and I, and I said something like, well, I'm, I had this feeling that I, I was in another religious uh, ceremony, and I had this feeling that, you know, there was something spiritual occurring that felt significant to me, but didn't have anything to do with the ceremony. And I said, I think Quakers have something to say about this. Let me go see what they're doing. This, this is how I came to Delphi to give it. And I explained that to many people. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, yeah, but why are you here? Why couldn't you, you, you could have gone anywhere else. Why are you here? I'm like, okay. I don't know. <laughs> Google no, Maps said you were eight minutes closer than my other options. Yeah, here I am. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate the history, and I I consider myself a Christian, <laughs> particularly at that time. There was just the, the background that I was more familiar with. It's like, and just, well, not all of us are. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Like, and that's that was not my experience here. Not clearly. I'm just sharing that to say. Sure. So. But 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 yeah. but the. the deeper lesson for us is asking you to reveal yourself before we right, yes. decide to reveal our right. 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 Yeah. was off-putting to somebody just walking into the That's door for the first right. time. Right. Mm -hmm. And as we're thinking about how we welcome people, it's not so much, well, why did you come here? It's, Let me tell you why I'm here. Right? Mm. And that might have, there might have been something if we were revealing more, that might have made it an easier conversation. That's a good point. Thanks for sitting yeah. 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 and, 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 and just to kind of piggyback on what Rich was saying, that sense of reciprocity. Yeah. Is it a relationship where I share and you share together, or is it that someone uses the word interrogation? Yeah. Yeah. Quick, We're gonna, yeah. quick related note, um, I'm a psychotherapist, and when I meet with uh, an individual adult or a couple uh, for the first time, I start by sort of going through a list of what we'll do. And the first thing I do is introduce myself yeah. and give my background, my theoretical background, my work background, so they have a sense of who they're working with. And, and to, a, to a person, they always say, you know, I really appreciate that you did that. That yeah. you started this off in that way. So we had an idea of who we were turning ourselves over to. And it's a little bit different of a turning them over, but, but it's, there are ways in which it's very simple. Absolutely, it, it, and and when you encounter people, and I don't, I'm, there may be folks in this room who have this experience, but who've undergone or experienced spiritual trauma in a faith community, mm -hmm. it's a very, it's very vulnerable. It right. it is a turning over. I'm trusting you with this phase of my spiritual journey. And let me speak to what Nick said. I've been coming to this meeting for about eighteen months, and I've gotten to know very few people outside, and I joined a friend the AIDS group mostly because I wanted to get to know some people. Mm -hmm. um, and I came here in part because, okay, I don't know many people, so maybe I will get to know a few people who aren't either from my friend the AIDS group or the poetry group that I'm 
go to or from friends' house, right. which are the three places where I've gotten to know people. I've gotten to know almost no one by going to meeting for worship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a, I'm gonna let you guys go for a break uh, <laughs> because I've been promising and it's almost, it's, at, it's like 11.15. So we'll go for a break until 11.25, but I will say yes, 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 underline, 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 <laughs> exclamation point. And have you considered inviting people to lunch? So go for your break. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you at 11.25. I, I want to add one thing before we go. Just talking about it. So for our lunch, maybe it's incumbent upon those of us here to be intentional about not just sitting with our dad and lunch. Yes. 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 And uh, and welcome and welcome back. Oh, yes. Thank you, Jim. Well, maybe I can. I have to leave. Um, so I'll share this with Joan, but I just put this up here as some ways to affirm gifts in others. Some uh, sentence stems that you can uh, complete, but that might give a way to um, to practice recognizing and affirming gifts in other people because. Uh, we don't, in my experience, often have this as a habit. And so we got to kind of build our muscles in that way. And by the way, this is not unique to friends. There are lots of faith communities uh, that might theoretic, that might like acknowledge that spiritual gifts are a thing in the abstract, but not necessarily be intentional about, about naming and affirming them. So... In a way, this is a reflection of our time and culture. Yes. We're, we're taught, really, to criticize. Mm -hmm. We're not taught to reinforce positive behavior, mm -hmm. which is much more constructive. Absolutely. It, it, I read a book that really changed the way that I thought. It was called Practicing, Practicing Affirmation, and the subtitle was... I don't, I don't remember what the subtitle was, but it was basically affirming others and what God is doing in and through others mm -hmm. as a spiritual discipline of community. Mm -hmm. And the, the author made the point, like, uh, if you ever read um, the New Testament, you see like Paul's epistles to different churches. He's not writing them because everything's going great. <laughs> he's writing them because they're marrying their stepmothers. Like it's mm -hmm. not, it's like gnarly stuff but he invariably starts like are we do i have to tell you this and the answer is yes yes you do have to tell them that paul um for some reason they did not realize that marrying their stepmothers was like not okay but he always starts with i give thanks to god for you because i'm about to tell you about why you can't tell poor people to sit on the floor and rich people to sit on the chairs I'm about to tell you why you can't continue offering offerings to idols and follow Christ. I'm going to tell you why you can't marry your stepmother. But before I tell you any of those things, I'm going to tell you why I thank God for you and what I already see in, in you and in your church that's so valuable and precious and important. And that is, to Kendra's point, super chemical. <clears throat> that is not normal. That is not how we usually interact with each other. Well, but that is the skill. Uh, I mean, John Gottman talks about having a soft start. If you're going to get into something that potentially conflictual, you have a soft start so that there is some connection before you get Last. into the rest of it. Absolutely. And to the point about eldering, when you have a culture that is affirming, that does recognize where we're already growing, where we're already being faithful, when there does come that moment of, hmm, you might've missed the mark. There's already such a foundation laid of, I love you, I respect you, I mm -hmm. see how you're growing, I see what God is doing through you. And when I share this with you, it's out of that <laughs> place and not out of a judgmental place mm -hmm. of like, this is why you're bad. Mm -hmm. Cause you already know that I don't think you're bad cause I tell you that all the time. <laughs> Yeah. But and if you don't tell your own heart to that interaction, that 
I'm not just gonna share what I know and impart to you a concern, mm -hmm. but there's like what was said earlier, there are can I even take myself out of making the assumption about why you absolutely did that thing or whatever? Absolutely. Absolutely. That we start with that um that attitude of uh, curiosity to understand what's going on. So it's already 1130, mm -hmm. which means we have 29 minutes, allegedly. This is what we've been told. <laughs> but I, so I want to just talk a little bit about legal. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Mary. Yeah, that's the subtitle. God-centered praise for those who are not God. Um, so it's not just, I like your purple skirt, right? Mm -hmm. It's not just whatever, but it's it's really focusing on the spiritual aspect. And so that's part of what builds that culture of spiritual intimacy and respect and, and mutual value and appreciation. We talk somewhat about mutual accountability, but it's also important to talk about mutual accountability, uh, appreciation and inspiration. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about leadings um, because, well, hold on. So there's a reason I was supposed to do the word association. Uh, very transparently, I'm trying to like think in my head about the best use of our remaining time. Mm -hmm. Like I said, none of the time is wasted. I hope that this has been a very rich time so far. Mm -hmm. And I always struggle when I'm facilitating mm -hmm. about giving you your money's worth. <laughs> and so my temptation is to try to cram too much mm -hmm. into a brief period of time. And so I'm trying to resist that temptation, but I'm experiencing it. Just like, shut up and let me fire hose information at you. Maybe, That's not good. Maybe we need to have you for part two. <laughs> <laughs> <Maybe. Yeah. laughs> like I said, there's no upper limit. Yeah. I thought, I thought we said we were going to go to 1230. Oh, I, I misunderstood. I don't know I that's that's okay. It was 9 30 to 12 30. No. And then I saw it was nine. I yeah, saw an earlier thing. It was nine to 12. Yeah. This, is, this, this is amazing. You should. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, oh my gosh. I'm just like that. I feel like the gift of an hour. I, I, the weight just rolled off of my shoulders. This Good. is incredible. Thank you, Joe. Um, so at the same time, Adrian, I want to say I really like to be fed and to be hearing more from you because we don't get to see you and we can you set the stage for us doing more sharing. Right. So I'd like very much for you to impart your your well, gifts. Well, now that I know that we have way more time than I thought. We can we can do like all of the above. I'm just gonna do a quick. I'm gonna set my timer. Like I don't know what people did before. You had a computer and a clock and boom. It also makes calls. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> um, I just want to do a quick word association. I set my timer for a couple. It takes a couple of minutes, but. What do you think of when you think of that word leading? What does that mean? What is this? What does that I mean? Say the word is believing. Leading. Yeah. You can't not do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just call it out. There's no right or wrong. We're just it trying implies to following. At least in part. At my stage of life, it's an urgent responsibility. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, always an opportunity. A welling it's up. Say that again. Welling up. Welling up. Shepherd. From spirit. Yeah, I'm sure. No right or wrong. It's just a bit affirmed, uh, affirmed by others. Mm -hmm. 
it's often something I really don't want to do. I'd rather not do it. <laughs> but it doesn't go away. You know? yeah. Yeah. So there's a resistance piece. I was going to say something about like testing a leading and discerning a leading, which are sort of related to what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. We need others. Okay. And I, if we were to get deeper into this, I wanted to distinguish between a leading and a calling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like when I think of resisting something, I think I'm resisting a calling. And for me, a leading is something that I am I have embraced. Right now we're just putting it out. I have I have my own thoughts, which we, you will hear. You will hear that. But we've got 47 more seconds to hear yours. Just get it out. If there's anything else you want to add. There's a boldness to it. Like one, it's not a, it's not a tentative. Yeah, you know, you can sit there tentatively thinking about it, but once you step your foot out there, it's, it's there's some boldness to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Eight seconds shy, but we'll <laughs> take, it. take it. So as I was thinking about and reflecting on and reading in preparation for this, this felt like the a good explanation of a leading. We are led by the spirit to concrete acts of faithfulness, whether individually or as a group. And so key aspects, right, helpfully underlined. Mm -hmm. Where does the leading come from? Yeah. And what is the leading to? And who receives the leading? Mm -hmm. And each one of these elements is an opportunity and a responsibility for that testing and discernment. One of the things that kind of came up um, as Joan and I were talking, because uh, I, I asked her, I said, you know, obviously I just did a weekend long workshop on spiritual gifts where I was regretting not having enough time. <laughs> so yeah. what an art are we supposed to talk about in three hours? Three and a half hours, so that's. Um, so you know, my question for her and some other friends in the meeting was kind of where's the meeting, and so we talked a little bit about that, which which helped me to focus. So one one thing that came up, and I, I give that all as a very long prelude because I want to give credit. Joan used the expression "major should," and I was like, Ooh, yes. Can you do the slideshow again? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Let me just uh, I can't read that. pop it up. <laughs> and will you share screen so we can see it? Yeah. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I thought I was. You slideshow. Okay, hang on one second. So it says I'm screen sharing. Is that not true? Ellen, can you see it? I can't see it. You can see it, Ellen? Okay, then it's something I'm doing wrong. Okay. I see your view. Yeah. If you see if you can change your view. Okay, yep. Um, so one of the... You flushed that out. <laughs> I got the seed. Look, you, you put yes, the seed. and then you flushed it out. Yeah. So sometimes it's really hard because we have a sense of urgency because of something that comes up. Maybe it's something that comes up in the culture, maybe it's something that comes up in the meeting, maybe it's something that comes up um, in the broader religious society of friends. And there's a sense of like, something needs to be done. So a major should comes in response to the moment. 
a leading comes in response to the spirit. A major should often confirms my priorities and my preconceptions. Mm -hmm. So there's that uh, story, and this is why I'm so bad. People are like, oh, you're a natural teacher. I'm like, that is incorrect, because I have I do not remember details well. Um, but was it, it, who was it who was called to preach woe, felt like he was called to preach woe, and was told he had to season it? Does anybody know that story? So there was a, a probably 17th or 18th century young minister who felt like he got a message to like preach a message of destruction, change your ways, or you're going to be judged. And he was told by the elders, like, season that. Not sure that that's there yet. And gradually that sense of leading dissipated because it wasn't a true leading. If you're called to like say good things to people that you're already feeling warm to and bad things who you are to people that you're already feeling hostile to, it might not be. A, <laughs> doesn't mean for sure it's not. But that's a question where it's like, I think we want to sit with this and see where this goes. A leading to Bonnie's observation often contradicts my preferences and desires. It's often going to be something that's hard or that requires me to lay down something that I maybe didn't even realize I was carrying. Um, when we think about a major should, there's that temptation to say yes to every good thing. Of course we should do this. And of course we should do that. And of course we should do that. Because it's a good thing to do. And those things might be very good things to do. That doesn't mean that we we can do all of them, even if we want to. It doesn't mean we're called to do all of them. So a leading in, when you're inserting a leading, you're free to say no to good things in order to say yes to the thing that you're called to do. Mm -hmm. So like I said, with my ministry support committee, I said, your job is to help me say no not because the things that I'm being asked to do are bad. They would not be a waste of time. They might be helpful and good. And also, I have a full-time job. I got married a month ago. I have a son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my gosh, and that's its own wonderful story. But um, I can't say yes to everything. And even if I had none of those things, I still couldn't say yes to everything. And every time you say yes to something, you're taking away your resources and time and energy from saying yes to something else. Right. So how can we be selective about our yes so that we can say yes to the things that the spirit is calling us to and not yes to every good thing because we cannot say yes to every good thing. But the major should, that voice of should tells us like, you have to do it. When we're thinking about a major should, we might be overwhelmed by how much there is to do and anxious that nobody else will do it. That's where you get that nominating committee that's like, oh, we have all these committee slots. This is bad enough. Good enough. You know, bad, you know. How do we fill all these slots? As opposed to we believe that God will raise up the right person at the right time. My meeting laid down our hospitality committee for two years. Couldn't fill the slots. There was always coffee. There was always snacks, even without the committee. At the right time, it was resurrected. Um, a major should. That's often about sending a message to the world. We have to take a stand. We have to take a stand as friends. A leading is often an invisible, or may st often starts as an invisible witness to a holy reality. So John Woolman, well before he was traveling and talking about the evils of Satan was wearing undyed fabric. That was his own leading to say, I'm not gonna participate in an economy that's based on dehumanizing people who are made in God's image. So whatever the world does or doesn't do, I know what I'm called to do. And that is to, to be in a different relationship to my consumer goods. Major should, presses us to ask, what must be done? There's all this stuff to do and someone's got to do it. I am that someone. When we're thinking about a leading, we ask, what is mine to do this time? So one of the things that's caused us great strife is the purchase of that. 
cottage over there, when I look at the way that happened, it might have been on that side of the list, which is a major truth. Because I, yeah, when I, I look at all those things and think of how, why we did this, did we take time to say, do we have a leading from spirit, from God, to, to do something, or to have this property for some, and, and there was no time we didn't do that. And if other people did it in the meeting, like the trustees, the rest of the city now mm -hmm. were not informed. Interesting. Just for your information, mm -hmm. it's a house. <laughs> <laughs> it's right next to the meeting, to this building. The, the brown one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The meeting almost that now. Okay. And, and, and some of us feel it was the major should and it was rushed. Um, and for me, it was the leader. Well, it was clear. And I don't, I, I don't want to like, I understand what people are saying, but I think the, the important distinction is not the timeline of the sense of urgency. Like you can have a sense of urgency, I think, about a meeting, and you can accomplish something that you're led to do in a timely fashion. You don't have to sit on it for it to be good. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. That's a good point. Absolutely. And in fact, oftentimes when the leading becomes clear, it does happen very quickly. Yeah. Right. Because there's unity of yeah. purpose. There's unity of like, okay, we're being brought together in the spirit. Now's the time. We don't need to wait. And that's when you see the faith oftentimes to delegate. Because it's like, we're clear as a body about how we're being called. We don't need to micromanage the details because we're all of one accord. When there is not that faith, the simplest thing becomes laborious because there's not a sense of trust and faith that we're moving together in the spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not the timeline necessarily. It's not the urgency necessarily. But it is the sense that um, just because something feels urgent and pressing, just to be aware, that could be anxiety talking. Mm -hmm. That could be other stuff. Not every voice that we hear is the voice of God. So just to be mindful of that and sensitive to that. My sense of personal readings that I've had is that there has always been a cause. Mm. There has often been something later that is what I would think of as a reward, but there has always been a cost, sometimes a great cost, but there's always been something later that has been a great reward. Mm. There is, in the things that I was deciding, uh, when I was trying to make the decision of what to include and what to not include, I had put together in my notes the um, five tests for discerning a leading. I have it written down someplace. I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. You guys can all read the left. But one of the things that that author, it's from the um, Tract Association of Friends, I believe, uh, talks about is, our early friends talked about um, not fleeing the cross. That when we have a leading, it is often going to involve mm -hmm. a form of sacrifice mm -hmm. on the front end. And um, I have learned to be skeptical of things that feel like leadings that demand stuff from other people and not from me. Mm -hmm. Like, that might be something else. And I was just gonna say, it seems like there's also a difference between a personal leading and a collective leading. Yes, so I was gonna say, yeah, I'm corporate. This is so good. <laughs> so I'm so glad you said that. Because um, as we're thinking about Check. leadings that's one key question is like what does it look like to what does it look like for a meeting community 
to participate in what God is doing, whether that leading is individual or corporate. And so I was thinking, and listen, I'm not a graphic designer. That's why I don't make charts like the one there. This is why you get this and not that one. But I was thinking of that chart when I was talking to, to Joan, because this is a chart, the are you called to share during a message? Are you called to share a message during worship? So there's this chart here, which you may have seen because um, it crops up, friends in our flow charts, mm -hmm. um, for how to test the leading to give vocal ministry. That's a specific leading. But that same testing can and should be generalized to how we think about testing every week. So I was thinking, okay, so how would I generalize this flow chart to testing a, a leading in general, not just in a meeting for worship? And, and where I started was, first off, you have to practice minding the light in daily life. So as you reach points of decision, to be conscious, to pause and say, what is God calling me to do right now? Um, I live in Newark, I commute into the city. Um, and I remember several years ago, uh, I was on a bus and there was a guy, I'll put him maybe around 50, who was really, um, he was clearly down on his butt. And he was loudly lamenting on the bus. He got on the bus, loudly lamenting to no one in particular about how he was homeless, didn't have any food, just needed some help. He wasn't asking anyone in particular for help, just saying like, I need some help, I need some help, I need some help. So I'm sitting on the bus being like, please don't look at me, basically. Okay, I'm just trying to go to work. I didn't get on this bus for all this. Um, and we got blessed stuff. And he got off and I got off. And I was like, <laughs> damn it. <laughs> I think I'm supposed to get this guy breakfast. So I go inside the train station. I ask him, you know, do you want to do you want me to get you breakfast? There's a Dunkin' Donuts in the train station. So we kind of get there and you know, he gets, I get him two breakfast sandwiches. I was like, you want coffee? Like, I like, like resenting every, but like, I think I have to do this. Um, and he asked me like, why are you doing this? I was like, uh, I think God helped me to. It's like a very awkward conversation. Everything about the situation was awkward. But that was like trying to listen, just trying to listen. Um, and it is weird sometimes, but, but, but it is a muscle. It is a muscle. And so that was a small sacrifice. It was like 10 minutes and $10. It's a very small sacrifice. How can you be ready to be led in a big way if you're not willing to be led in a small way? So how do we practice being willing to be led in a small way? So that's the first step of acting on what you before you even get the lead. It's just to listen. And then when you get the nudge, you test it. Is this a message from the spirit, not an impulse or a major should? So early friends, you know, uh, in the age of like seekers and uh, early friends kind of coalescing, there was a group that was very similar to friends, uh, except they wouldn't accept testing of their leadings. Oh, the ranters. The ranters. The ranters. <laughs> And so a ranter might be say like, well, you know, um, I know I'm like married with this family, but I'm being led to sleep with this other person. So, amen, let's do it. God can lead me any kind of way. Um, <laughs> from the 17th century. I don't know if we picked that up on the owl, but one of our participants in the room said, oh, I know some of them. God told me to, okay? So that, that goes back to that. If it's something that is like 
um, gratifying my baser desires, but leads me to betray my commitments, mm -hmm. probably not from the spirit, okay? Probably. <laughs> now, I always say probably because sometimes we make commitments that are wrong. So if you're in a gang and you promise to kill someone or engage in some criminal activity and then you feel led to break that commitment, I'm not gonna be the one to tell you that's not from the spirit. But you should be skeptical. In general, we should be very, very skeptical. So is this a message from the spirit and not from an impulse or major should? If so, does the spirit require action from me as an individual? So the, if the answer is yes, maybe we should be seeking that individualized support. And we can talk about where that can come from in the meeting. And then we turn to the light in that course of seeking that individualized support. And God willing, we engage in spirit-led action. But if the spirit requires action from me as an individual, it's worth considering whether the spirit requires action from us as a body. And if that's the case, there should be another box that says called meeting for worship or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But we engage in some form of corporate discernment together to say, okay, spirit's calling us to do something. What is that something? we turn towards the light and hopefully we prayerfully engage in spirit-led action. I'm gonna pause and just see if, how this is sitting with folks. Yes, go ahead, Matt. I, I wanna offer a comment that I really appreciate your turning toward the inward light. Many, that implies a corporate um, understanding and discernment of the light as a body in a community. Many of us these days think of that as the inner light, which is much more about me. Mm -hmm. And so how do you see, if you don't mind spinning it out, because I suspect you've thought about this once or twice. <laughs> so how do you see that impacting the the individual or corporate discernment around meetings, that dis that distinction, which some folks would go, it would go over inner, inward, whatever, but maybe not whatever. So would you, do you mind saying a couple more words about that? Well, it, it suggests to me the need for testing with other people <laughs> who also are sensitive to the corporate, or the communal discernment of the spirit. You know, seasoned people, I mean, there are some, when I go to my support committee, I've chosen them because I know for years they've been seasoning both through in their individual but communal practice. That they, in, they, they feel the divine love through one another. It's not just about me. It, that's the the rancher that you were, the modern day rancher is about me mm -hmm. as opposed to the benefit of the whole. Thank you for that. So one of the topics um, that that came up in our workshop at Pendle Hill a couple of weeks ago um, that was really powerful and also is its own weekend workshop is the topic of spiritual authority and what does that mean? Because if you come into a space and, and your orientation is, who are you to tell me that what I'm hearing is not from God? Mm -hmm. You cannot engage in this process in a meaningful way. It's only when we trust each other's discernment enough to say, I heard this thing, I think it's from God, can you help me? determine whether it is. And even if I think you are wrong, so think about that young minister who felt like he had this leading to go and preach this fire and brimstone message and was told to wait. He thought that they were wrong. He's like, why are you inhibiting me from doing what God is calling me to do? And it was only in the process of big scary word, submitting, mm -hmm. 
the leading to the corporate discernment that he was able to get to the point of saying, ooh, ooh, actually there was more of me in that and less of God in that right. than what I initially thought. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes the meeting will say, no, don't do it. And they are. <laughs> There's a reason it took 80 years for slavery to be stamped out of the religious society of friends. They were literally waiting for meeting clerks to die because they were blocking the movement of the spirit. But there's also a reason that there's not a Southern Quaker church and a Northern Quaker church. And there's a reason that um, those things had already been resolved among friends a hundred years before they were resolved in the country. It was because even though for many friends, the leading was clear and became increasingly clear over time. And even though it was clear that there were people blocking the movement of the spirit, there was a commitment to stick with each other and to labor together. Whereas before they had separated. Right, well, I was raised Baptist. And it's funny because I tell people like, oh, my family's from South Carolina. And they're like, so you're Southern Baptist? And I was like, you do not know much about Baptist. <laughs> there are Black Southern Baptists, but not that many. Not that many. So, so I think another piece here is the element of humility. And what we don't like talking about, especially as women, is that we have to surrender. Mm -hmm. And we have to accept um, that there are, that, that we're just... Uh, we're important, but we're small. Mm. You know, we're part of a whole. We're part, and the, the symbiosis of all is what potentiates individual leaders or leader or leadings, I guess. Ooh. But that doesn't happen if we don't turn it over and let go first and allow the humility of getting out of the way and is, is, you know, we really have to ask, is this about me or is this about something that needs to move forward? I've got like chills because you, you, you said a lot in a very few words. There's a piece that's broad culture. There's a piece of um, almost, it feels resonant with like American exceptionalism and like going off and being the cowboy on the white horse and I'm gonna be the hero of the story. There's a gender piece of like, if you are a member of a group that's been systematically excluded from power, then what is re-triggered when, when it's told to you, you have to wait, you have to surrender, you have to submit. Like those are hard words, they're hard words in general and maybe extra hard if you have that traumatizing history. Mm -hmm. There's a diversity, great theological diversity. I will say, frankly, there are folks in my meeting, in my meeting, which I love. I love my meeting. I went to, I spent two years going to different meetings in New York and New Jersey before I landed on my meeting. I went there for like two months and I was like, okay, ready to transfer my membership. So I love my meeting. And I would not pick randomly in my meeting for someone to serve on a clearness committee with me. Okay. Because even though I have a high level of trust for the community as a whole, that does not mean that I have that same high level of trust for every specific individual. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, recognize when the spirit is talking. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know what a clearness committee is supposed to be doing and not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what does it look like to create an environment mm -hmm. where we know each other well enough and where we have the habits of the heart and the shared foundation in our faith and practice as friends to trust each other to help us do this work. There's some foundation laying that has to happen before you get to the point of, yeah, go ahead, Kendra. I, I personally, I don't think this is from spirit, think that we need to modify that a little bit because this is not a meeting of 15 people. So that we know enough people that we can find the people mm. who we can trust for something like that. Mm -hmm. How does that how does that sit with friends? Or we know who to ask. 
We may not know them, but we know who to ask. We can find who to ask. <laughs> or so, taking a step back further, we know who to ask, but they'll know who to ask. That's what I'm going to say. Right, yeah, right. thank you. But, but so Go ahead, another facet of that is we do most of our corporate discernment in meeting for worship for business, mm -hmm. and very few friends come. Mm -hmm. And yet, in talking with other meetings, I hear we have a good attendance at meeting for business. <laughs> um, but but there are people that I trust the spirit and I trust in that way don't come to meeting mm -hmm. for business and whose voices and spirit doesn't get part of the corporate discernment. And I mean, I said something to somebody the other day. Um, it was an impulse. They, it was, I don't remember who it was. Um, what was it? Maybe it was somebody in this room. I never, they said, I never come to meeting for business. And I, and I'm part of the meeting and I do, I, and I never come to meeting for business. And I said, well, that's a problem. And so it's working. And then I, and I said, because <laughs> I would like to have your spirit there with us. And so it's <laughs> worth asking. And so this, so this is kind of like a recurrent problem that I've seen. The decisions get made by the people who show up and the people who show up make the decisions that work for them. And so there was a whole issue and my poor meeting, my meeting's wonderful. And I just keep saying that because I use all these examples of like traumatic things that have happened in my meeting. <laughs> but like, if it weren't wonderful, I wouldn't still be there, right? I have the... I became <laughs> so like so I had so so um so my son is eight like I mentioned and when I was uh before he was born I attended almost every meeting for worship with the concern for business mm -hmm. I was there very happy to be part of the corporate discernment after he was born I would only come if I had a committee report because mm -hmm. there was no child care mm -hmm. and I was like ready to snap because I was. Uh, I had drafted, I was on MNC, I drafted the state of the meeting report and I had to present it. And I'm like, how can it, you know, here's the state of the meeting. And also, how can it possibly be that you tell me how much you appreciate my service, you tell me how much you appreciate my presence in the meeting, and you are making no effort to make it possible to come. The message that I get is that my voice mattered more when I was childless than it does as a mother. Wow. Nobody said that, but I can tell because you haven't facilitated my participation. Mm -hmm. That was a hard thing for me to say because it hurts, one, because the content of it hurts, but also it's hard to say those kinds of things to a community where you really value them mm -hmm. because I like to focus on the things that are positive and working and flourishing and not on the areas where I am feeling wounded. And I will say, and this is why I say my meeting wonderful. Three months later, there was childcare every mm -hmm. meeting for because it was like, oh, you're right. And we hadn't noticed because the people who were there were mostly empty nesters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're not thinking about child care. It's not their problem. So then how do we develop the muscle mm -hmm. of saying, oh, Adria used to come to every business meeting she hasn't come in a while maybe I should ask her why that is mm -hmm. and see if there's something that we could do or maybe you know so maybe there are there's some meetings where people have their fellowship they go home they um we get on a, on zoom since the pandemic we do our business meeting on zoom there are other meetings where they'll just run it they won't do fellowship they'll run it straight from worship into business meeting with the feeling that people will need to have their day so let's just go on ahead and do it we'll do it together and then that way friends can leave as they need to but we're not taking up all day some places they'll have lunch in between because that's what's needed in order to keep people there you know they say an army marches on its stomach a friend's meeting also <laughs> discerns on its stomach <laughs> so different meetings might have different needs but it's a problem if people are clearly committed to the meeting and not committed to doing the decision and, 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 and for whatever reason, don't feel called to or committed to or open to or welcome to participate in the corporate discernment. Yeah. I'm feeling called to say something right now that feels sort of tangential and sort of on topic, but I just, I, I feel like this overwhelming urge to, to, to talk about this. Um, like 
So uh, I've been working a lot with other public ministers and um, in the United States in particular, and overwhelmingly this class of people um, is feeling really disconnected from their meetings and have lost faith that their meetings can change and find a way of supporting them materially and spiritually. And I admit, I have been in that place. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really grateful that, you know, I was able to articulate that and kind of get support for, for my own faithfulness. And I, and so there, I've actually heard one person say in the last week that they no longer believe in congregational life. Um, which is big in a Quaker context, <laughs> really big. Um, and this person is really prominent. Um, and um, I, um, I'm just struck by how like the process of struggling with one's meeting is is so hurtful for so many people. And, um, and I've, I've kind of come to the, so I've seen us change in my time here in good ways, <laughs> in, way, in ways that I think, you know, increase our, our faithfulness. And then that increases my faithfulness when I see that. And I still feel exhaustion and hurt about things. And as long as I'm honest about it, I feel like I can you know, receive the help I need, that I am in communication, that I am in negotiation, that I am in discernment with my meeting. And I sort of come to the, like, two conclusions that I, I feel some clarity about right now. And one is that this meetings can change. Meetings will change. Meetings will necessarily change. As long as we're alive, we're changing. Like, to not change is to be dead. And I realize some people think Quakerism is dead, but we're in this room, we're not dead. <laughs> and like, and, and, and so, so your meeting can change. And I think, you know, the question that I think I've been posing, you know, with some of the people that I work with is, do you have the resources, the internal, social, spiritual, and material resources you need to be a facilitator? of that change? Like, what is it that you need to be a facilitator of that change? And is it only your meeting that you can look to for that? And when I say that, I don't mean, like, go exclusively outside of your meeting and formal fan club or something. That's still, that's still, you know, you by yourself, the cowboy or cowgirl or whatever. <laughs> um, but finding ways of creating an environment that enables you to create an environment in your own worshiping community that brings everybody into greater faithfulness feels really important to me. And it may not all be already at the local meeting. And the other thing I feel like I've really come to clarity about is that um, I just forgot what I was coming to clarity about. Give me a second. I got I, I felt something and then I forgot what I was talking about. Um oh, that the process is the ministry. Like that that like all these gifts we're talking about, they don't have a product at the end of them. They do, they do. Just like the skills have a product. The skills are going towards a product. And you know, I know in my own life I have gained skill, I've gained also spiritual maturity. Um, you know, I'm not as mouthy as I used to be. And it's not because I'm afraid, it's because I've learned how to control myself so that I can be kind to other people. That's a skill, not a leading. And I um so I feel like, you know, these leadings, these skills, these spiritual gifts, they do have some kind of product, but that's not what the ministry is. The ministry, whatever your gifts are, is to bring your worshiping community, the people that are in intimate relationship to you, that is where your commitments are, that is 
where your intimacy is, that we are bringing each other into a place, place of faithfulness. And that is a living thing. I am so glad that you said that, Wendy, and like my face got all like hot because um, that is a big part of why I really appreciate this framework. Um, because a meeting that only cares for the people who are already there and is not concerned about faithfulness or building or invitation or um, being grounded uh, mind and spirit in like our tradition, our living tradition as friends might be very comfortable and cozy for the eight people who are there, but it will eventually die and it will not serve anyone. It will not bless anyone who is around and there will be people who could have been brought into something beautiful who will not be because they're just concerned about their little thing. Um, similarly, this is not really a problem that you see too often about unprogrammed friends, but you see this, there's a, a wonderful, wonderful um, podcast by Christianity Today about uh, the collapse of this church out in Seattle called Mars Hill. It's so I've listened. I've listened to it like four times. Was, so, so the podcast is called "The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill," and so Mars Hill Church was a church in Seattle that was led by a very charismatic, gifted preacher, gifted writer. I have like three of his books on my shelf. So I found him in these books. I was like, oh, pretty good. I don't look into this guy. They were like the first church to put a sermon online. They were the first church. They 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 still have two or three of their worship bands after the church collapsed. Are still making music. It's really. I don't. I'm. I'm not a big CCM person, but I'm like, oh, this is good. So what did What did you say the bottom line was on this? The bottom line is. Yeah, I know. I know. I know. <laughs> the bottom line is that was a church that started off beautiful. It started off with a balance of invitation, care and shepherding, prophetic truth telling, building, and it wound up because the most visible person was the pastor because he's a gifted teacher, mm -hmm. gifted writer. Gifted preacher. I mean, you can love him or hate him, but you, but the magnetism and the and the um, creativity of his teaching, undeniable. It became all about him, mm -hmm. and so that pastoral care fell away because it was all about you know how do we grow the numbers? How do we have this content creation machine? Mm -hmm. The gift was real, mm -hmm. but it wasn't balanced by the other gifts. It wasn't balanced by humility and teachability and that sense of we need each other. So no matter how the gifts, one, are widespread, that was something Patty reminded me to say, that everyone has spiritual gifts. And we need to be in dialogue with people with different gifts in order to be faithful because we will see from through our lens Oh, the most important thing is inviting new people. Oh, the most important thing is caring for the people who are here. The most important thing is sound teaching. The most important thing is faithfulness. The most important thing is building institutions that'll last. We'll all see it through our own lens and in our own way. But if we're not in dialogue with other people, with other gifts, we cannot see the full picture of what God calls us to be. So much appreciation. Much appreciation for that. I'm going to give... Folks, because we're all, now we're really almost in time. Thank you. <laughs> Take care, Pat. Um, why don't you hop back in your triads a little bit and talk a little bit about you? I'm going to give you eight minutes. I, is it okay if we go to like 35? Mm -hmm. Oh, stay for that. Okay. So if you can get Mariana and Ellen back into a group, I, I just want to invite friends to debrief a little bit about how this has been. And then we'll do, we'll do a large group, a large circle leading. But you can share about, let's talk about leadings because we had some time talking about gifts. What's rising for you about this from this conversation about leadings? Okay. Nice and open-ended. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank you again. Thank Understand what the relationship is. And it's true. I don't know how to say it. I think it takes time. It takes time. And what I do. I have a great environment. I see my dad. She likes
it is no, but, which is wonderful because you guys have the opportunity we can mix and mingle and then you have a brown bag lunch so the conversation doesn't have to stop it just we just have to press pause on it for just a minute <laughs> So friends, you, this is fabulous because hopefully this is a piece of a conversation that continues, but I, uh, as opposed to the end of a conversation is on the front end and not the back end. Um, there are people, uh, for Marianna and Ellen, I don't know how things were in your room, but in this room, I said, come on back, and nobody moved. And I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad to know that uh, that the conversation, no, that, that, that that's real conversation that's happening and meaningful conversation, because that's important. But in their case, we could push a button and, and, and then we had to force them back. So that's the that's the artificiality uh, of the Zoom. Maybe you guys would have <laughs> no folks came back and I, I appreciated it. Um, but I do want to just close the formal part of our time together. I said it's not the end of the conversation, just pressing pause on it. Um, so we've talked about a lot. In every section of what we talked about could have been a weekend or a week. There is much more to be said and to be fruitfully said, but I want to invite us to close by sharing something that we will carry forward from the time we spent together this morning. And I wonder if there's a bold friend who might be willing to start us off. Now, if you start us off, you get to decide whether it goes to the right or the left. So you got a lot of power. Because I was a little distracted, can you remind me, maybe us, as, what the topic is? For absolutely, absolutely. So as we close the formal part of our time together, I want to invite friends to share what's one thing they will carry forward with them from this morning's workshop. I came with a grateful heart and it's more full now and more grateful. I've made two new connections with Bonnie and Sue. And I think I love us because we keep seeking and struggling and sharing and discerning. It's really very beautiful and exciting. <laughs> uh, I think I'm taking away that I've I've made I've made more connections. I feel like I'm more of a part of the meeting than I've felt before in the in the time that I've been coming to me, because I've made more connections with people in the meeting. And that feels good. Like you go, Joan. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I'm taking away is um, a um, gratefulness that we were able to talk and share with each other at the level that we 
did. And then I'm looking around the room and around our meeting and thinking, who are the people that I wish had been here? Which committees, the change group, the, the um, growing our meeting folks, the who aren't here, who if we could all listen and hear the some of the same thing and do the same thing, we would get uh, further along in a unified mm -hmm. faith community. I think uh, I mean they can't I was going to do them at the end because they don't know that they're in the middle um <laughs> absolutely well, should I go now um so oh am I unmuted yes you can hear me okay um Oh, I'm taking a lot with me. Um, one of the pieces I shared with Ellen that I really appreciated is that the idea that when you're testing a leading, it's that there's specificity to the testing, right? Like you're not just testing a leading, you're testing the source. You're testing the concrete acts of faithfulness. You're testing the popular, you know, where it's going. Um, and uh, and then the difference between individual testing and corporate testing. Um, and I just have lots to chew on there. So, and I also, I'm, I hear you, Joan, you did not say that to me, but um, I now feel uh, like I not only should go to a business meeting, but maybe I want to. <laughs> <laughs> You're getting some very supportive uh, this in the room. <laughs> um, I just want to say just in general that I, I really appreciate these opportunities to talk in a small group and one-on-one -on -one with each other. Um, we just, we don't have a lot of these opportunities, really. Um, you know, we're in, in, in meaningful worship, but we're not, you know, we might have a little conversation before or after or something, but there's nothing, you know, it's very casual and haphazard sort of thing. Um, you, you know, meeting for business, we're, we're mostly just sitting listening to reports and so forth. Um, there, there are there are not a lot of opportunities and, and to to have this kind of an interchange with others, and I I really um I really appreciate these these opportunities, um, um and I, I encourage us to to find ways to to do more things you know like this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I feel like I um, am hearing a message about transformation um, and about how um, transforming religious communities transform ministers and transforming ministers transform religious communities that um, much like this toy <laughs> that can be all kinds of things and different assemblages of colors and, and have different uses. Oh, like you just did it wrong. That's <laughs> um, some stuff. Thank you for eldering me, Deborah. Um, but, you know, much like this toy, you know, we are flexible and can find new ways of being assembled together and that much like this we give each other permission to talk and we give each other permission to listen and we are alive right now and together and we can grow together. it doesn't doesn't it <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hand it off, still messed up. Um, That's just like for me, it's 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 an awareness of um, the the difficulty of transitioning from individual leading to 
corporate leading, because we are so large, is a multi-step process, not a single process of a single meeting and then the meeting coming together. We're too big for that. And so we have a three or a four step process that we have to go through. And what was interesting is seeing that that there are, you know, 15 of us or 20 of us who are interested in this, uh, who have some of the same starting point understandings about how to, how to start to move ahead. But it's going to be a complicated process that will take time and some discipline and some willingness among all of us uh, to evangelize elsewhere. <laughs> 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 so, um, speaking of things that you're handed that aren't perfect, <laughs> yeah. um, as your incoming clerk <laughs> of the meeting, I am acutely aware that there is some brokenness in our structures and our the ways in which we are conducting our meeting for business, which make it not, uh, which make it more of a marathon of service than a, <laughs> a spiritual um, experience to come to meeting for business. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, having the people that I have um, felt mentored by in the spirit and discernment, you know, I was saying to Patty earlier, I was like, you know, when I see you and Joan in the room, I know that, like, our discernment, we'll have discernment and we'll have um, spirit here, right? And that's what meeting for business needs us all to be for each other. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm also uh, taking away um, this this idea that it's not just the, the gifts aren't always loud and, and visible, that there are people who have, like I'm an introvert and I feel like through my service to the meeting, I, I discern a ministry of welcome, um, but that wasn't obvious to me because my instinct as an introvert is like, I'm good. <laughs> now let's not talk about it. But <laughs> um, through service on RE committee, understanding that families need a welcome and an explanation and a, a group of people to talk to, I did that. And it felt good and I think it was appreciated. And it's, um, but there are different ways, I guess, of doing a ministry of, you know, welcome to hospitality. That, and as many of those ways that we can gather and develop, will be stronger. It's, how are we supposed to do this while speaking? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I got it. Um, <laughs> Those young people. <laughs> its target audience is one year old, so I'm just <laughs> saying. <laughs> so back to the our Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, well, so let's see, what am I thinking? I'm thinking the the impression that I got of all of the, I mean, I don't even know that many people in this meeting yet, and I was still going through a list in my head and still coming up with things that I think people are gifted in or at least suited for, and that was, that was a fun little uh, experience to have and a fun, you know, you know, thought to have in the head about other people, to hear what other people think about other people. It's, um, you know, glad to be taking that knowledge and Everyone else in the meeting. And also, I'm struck kind of by how we were talking about gifts and we we're talking about leading, and still we ended up coming back to I think the things that we all really wanted to talk about, which was how our own meeting is doing, how our own process, <laughs> and how 
easy and pleasant that was, and it doesn't feel like it was out of place or or disconnected from the content that we had to address or anything like that. And so um, I'm, I'm very content with that as well. That's what I do. This means you get to mess it up for <laughs> <laughs> I get to I get to find another form of perfect. <laughs> <laughs> From what I've seen, that it's I've seen multiple, and mm -hmm. I've learned a lot from one-year-olds. Mm -hmm. um, I I used to be definitely afraid of them because I was pretty sure that you know if I handled one, it, it might break. Um, <laughs> and um, but anyway. It's perfect again, or perfect, yeah. Uh, um, so it it is um, lovely every time I get the opportunity to um, sit with a you know a, a medium sized group of folks that are here to share love. Um, and um, I, which I experienced today and I'm grateful for um, and I'm terribly thankful that there are more opportunities to come in steps um, you know 102 through um, you know <laughs> how much time I've got and there you go. Thank you. <laughs> There's so much that, that I'm grateful for and I'm taking away change by this workshop. Um, I had never thought about identifying spiritual gifts with individuals in the meeting before. Um, I have never seen the way forward to test whether something is a leading or not. Um, but I think the greatest um, realization that I had as a result of coming here is that there are enough people with the desire to make our meeting much better, um, even here, so that I'm confident that it's going to happen. Oh, boy. Um, so many thoughts. Um, I, um, I turned 71 on September 11th. Um, and I'm aware that having turned 71 on September 11th, that I have outlived both my father and his father. Mm -hmm. And so the, the sort of confluence of the September 11th birthday and having outlived now both my father and his father, um, leave me deeply aware and appreciative of the opportunities that are awaiting me. Um, and deeply aware of how precious um, Mary Oliver comes to mind. What would you do with your one wild and precious life? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm due to retire from my psychotherapy job in May. Mm -hmm. And this both gives me pause mm -hmm. and excitement, right? What the hell am I gonna do with my time? And um, part of my gift from being here uh, was having both uh, more peace about not knowing entirely what I would do, and uh, also a couple of new ideas um, and more faith uh, that I, along with my various circles of uh, people who I know and trust and love, um, will I'll find a path. Thank you. Jenny Dallas. Hello. 
Now, Jim, I am going to interrupt, just ask you to be part of our closing. Captain, <laughs> how about? Um, uh, what did I do? I took away all of your love for this meeting and some extensive notes on Luke chapter 30. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It'll be exciting tomorrow morning. Yeah. I, I highly recommend it. While, while I have your attention, I could just say, um, we need to clear that table before two o'clock. So just keep that in mind for lunch. And I sense it all of you a spiritual gift for taking Halloween decorations out of our attic. <laughs> <laughs> you can put that spiritual gift to work. Yes. Thank <laughs> 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 So Mariana went, she did go, um, and um, I think I will, and Ellen, uh, and Ellen had to, uh, yeah. um, but I will share that I am so grateful to have been able to spend this morning with you and help um, create a space for a different type of conversation. And I am so excited to see what happens. So I know that as a member of Wendy's Ministry Support Committee, I will be getting updates. Yeah. So I will be looking forward to hearing those updates and, and, and what happens. And um, I'll share this if you don't mind sending it out, Joan. Yeah. I'll send I'll yeah. send you the, the slides or, or, or Jim. Jim's I'm, gonna do I'm just gonna reply all on whatever email. I, I've already sent you all the it's an email with your Okay, so those people do not touch anything like any of these or perfect. This is what this is a water plenty to send us and the recording. No, it's just an email to put you all on the same chain. So then we could then we could just reply all and then do all the So you'll have all of these um suggestions for affirming gifts and others. You'll have affirmation. I really like them. Yeah. I'm so glad and I hope they're <laughs> use them use them in good health um you also not waiting for business you'll have to see yeah <laughs> i mean you can you can you'll have my you know poorly designed flow chart and um and definitely my my blessing as you continue this work so thank right. you thank all you friends so thank you <laughs> yeah. thank you so much this afternoon yeah i'm gonna you know, I'll linger for a little bit and then I'm going to go and meet my brother for lunch in Columbia with his family. Wow. And uh, then I'm going to head back up the <laughs> the open road back to the Garden State. Exactly right. Yeah, the, the, turnpike. the turnpike. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> just there. The Garden State Parkway. No, you're going to yeah, I'm going to take that's the Garden State better than the Thank you, Mary <laughs> Take care, Mary Ann. Luke, lovely to meet you. I'm so glad you could come. And they're looking forward to seeing you at business meeting. Yes. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> that was 10 15. She might be able to make it at 10.